Section number 81 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Valley Where Dusk is Death. A belt of poison night where death strikes with the dusk extends down the western slope of the Peruvian Andes. This death belt, first reported by a Spanish physician in 1630, consists of a few narrow valleys at an elevation of from 3,000 to 8,000 feet in an arid, very desolate, and sparsely inhabited country. Nearly everyone who spends a night there is afflicted a few days later by a severe anemia, which often proves fatal. This is the Veruga disease. The red blood cell count drops very rapidly. It is not known whether the cells actually are destroyed by the disease or whether it inhibits the forming of new ones from the bone marrow. The effect in either case is the same. The blood loses its capacity to carry oxygen and the victim slowly smothers. The malady is known as Carrion's disease. In 1885, a Peruvian medical student named Carrion inoculated himself with it to prove its identity. He succeeded in showing the cause at the cost of his own life. He had been inspired to the foolhardy act by extreme patriotism. The Chile-Peru War was just over. Most work on the disease had been done by the Chileans. Carrion desired that the credit for medical research should come back to Peru. If one recovers from the anemia, a second stage of the malady sets in. The body is covered with wart-like growths, presumably due to some alteration in the blood supply to the skin. One attack gives immunity for life, but the death rate during the first stage is very high. During daylight, the death belt is perfectly safe. This has long been recognized by natives who travel through it freely between sunrise and sunset. The only permanent inhabitants of the region are persons who have recovered from the disease. The borders are sharply defined within a few yards of altitude. For some years, it has been recognized that the infection comes from the bite of a single species of sand fly, a vicious pest smaller than a mosquito. Protection is afforded only by special screens. Ordinary mosquito netting is worthless. The death belt is a place of bright sunshine nearly every day. The insects cannot endure light. They remain secluded, and it is difficult to secure specimens, even when the hiding places are known. As soon as darkness comes, they emerge in enormous numbers. Harvard entomologist who investigated the death belt a few years ago spent the hours between sunset and sunrise in a specially screened railroad car. A few moments outside might have proved fatal. Due to some delicate balance of nature, this sandfly seems to be confined almost exclusively to this locality. It is credited with causing about 7,000 deaths in the decade before the last war. End of section 81. Read by Kevin Waters of Spring Hill, Florida, January 31st, 2022. Section 82 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Enigma of Evolution. The Snake. Snakes once had legs. There is evidence in their anatomy that they are descended from four-legged land animals. The evidence is found especially in certain bones near the base of the tail of one of the largest of living snakes, the python, which is the most primitive of the order, and presumably nearest to the hypothetical ancestor. Although the snake remains an enigma of evolution, 
there is no doubt that it got rid of its legs because they were a distinct hindrance to its peculiar ways of life. The serpent is not very ancient, as animal types go. Evidently, it first appeared in the Cretaceous geological period, about 100 million years ago, when the great dinosaurs were the Earth's dominant animals. There are, however, no unquestioned fossils of snakes from the dinosaur days. The first snake-like creature known is represented by fossils from the Eocene, or Dawn Age, in North America. This was quite lizard-like in bone structure. It lived about 60 million years ago, when mammals were developing on Earth. Rocks in Germany, laid down about 20 million years later, yield fossils of true snakes of the generalized viper type. Sometime later come fossils of snake giants from Egypt. Some of these probably were 60 feet long, but all these were real snakes, with no traces of external limbs. The ancestor seems lost forever because snake skeletons are brittle and delicate and do not easily fossilize. Having discarded legs, serpents evolved means of locomotion suitable to their ways of life. This has sometimes been described as walking on the ribs. It requires a highly intricate coordination of ribs and muscles and can be compared best to rowing a boat. The life of a serpent, according to Dr. Alfred Lorcher of the British Museum of Natural History, is a matter of adjustments for what it has lost. It cannot masticate its food, so it swallows it whole. It can put a healthy human appetite to shame, yet it can, if forced to do so, starve for more than a year. Limbs are missing, so it walks on its ribs, swims and grips with its tail, and climbs with its scales. The outer skin does not grow, so from time to time it is peeled off neatly, even to the scales over the eyes. Taste is poor but this is compensated for by a strong sense of smell, in which the harmless tongue assists by catching the smell particles from the air. It is proverbially deaf, but may receive ample warning of danger from vibrations through solid objects, which reach its sensitive skin more swiftly than sound can travel through air. End of section 82. Section 83 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Fastest Growth on Earth. In the Beginning was vestureless life. It was the capacity for self-perpetuation and growth in nature, the property of a single complex chemical mixture, protoplasm. This protoplasm may have come here from another star, a single grain of cosmic dust blown out of the infinite. It may have been mixed by chance in the warm seas of the earth at the beginning of time. It may have been put together according to the design of some cosmic intelligence. It tended to segregate into billions of trillions of infinitesimally minute particles, each sufficient unto itself. The particles were purposeless, voracious, irresistible, and immortal. They threatened to devour space and time and all that was in them. A cell culture of elemental, inchoate life stuff whose original substance increased, theoretically, ten quintillion fold in forty weeks, has been described by Dr. Philip R. White of the Rockefeller Institute. In his experiments, he started with a pellet about the size of a grain of mustard seed 
cut from a wart-like excrescence on a tobacco plant. He watched it multiply until, arithmetically speaking, if no part had been discarded, it would have been an unorganized, purposeless, monster spheroid of life, 600 million miles in diameter, comparable in size to the whole solar system inside the orbit of Pluto. It had 12 weeks to complete its first year. At the same rate of growth, it then would have been a lusty infant the size of 400,000 solar systems. In a few more weeks, it could have swallowed the whole Milky Way galaxy. By the end of the second year, it would have filled all the space in known creation, consumed the substance of all the galaxies, and perished of starvation as it bulged outward into the emptiness of infinity. Such a nightmare actually happened in reverse. Dr. White had to do everything in a few test tubes, but he was able to witness such a phenomenal growth as man had not hitherto imagined. First, he placed his pellet in a special nutrient solution. It began to expand by the continuous process of splitting in two. Two cells became four, four, eight, and so on, infinitely. After about two weeks, Dr. White cut away a few pellets from the original mass and discarded the rest. These were placed in new nutrient solutions. Every two weeks, the experimenter would discard the bulk of each mass which had accumulated and start new cultures with the few pellets which he saved. Each culture increased in size about 50% a day. At the end of 40 weeks, he was left with something not much bigger than he had at the start, but the actual original pellet constituted only about a ten quintillionth of the final mass. He happened to have found in the tobacco excrescences an undifferentiated kind of life. The cells had no specialized function. In the actual plant, they were kept in order by the rest of the plant cell community, which has no use for cells with no job to do. Once in the nutrient solution, however, they were free of all inhibiting influences. They were not, and never became, wood cells, bark cells, pith cells, leaf cells, or any of the other numerous specialized kinds of cells which make up the plant world. They were something very close to the primeval plant cells from which in the course of a couple of billion years, all the others had been derived. Very early, these unit structures of life learned that they must stick together and do specialized jobs for each other under the actual conditions of nature. Out of these combinations of specialists has arisen all the magnificent structure of the living world. But the experimental cells at the Rockefeller Institution had nothing to do except eat and multiply. Each of them was potentially immortal. It did not die, but renewed its youth when it had reached its growth by becoming two baby cells. That is how life might have developed from the beginning, except for the fact that a cell must eat to live, and ordinarily does not have any accommodating scientist to feed it. End of section 86section 84 of the strangest things in the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the strangest things in the world by thomas henry birds that duel birds that hold fencing tournaments are the big billed toucans of barrow colorado island the smithsonian institution's tropical preserve in gatun lake panama canal zone they fence with their formidable beaks but seem careful not to hurt one another one scientist who studied barrow colorado's bird life described the birds as follows I saw fourteen toucans scattered about in a big leafless tree in the center of the jungle. Two appeared to be fencing. They stood in one spot and fenced with their bills for a half minute or so, rested, 
and were at it again. Presently they flew off into the forest, and then I noticed two others that had now begun to fence. Then one of these flew away, and the remaining one picked a new opponent and fell to fencing again. They did not move about much while fencing, although sometimes one climbed above the other as though to gain an advantage. They fenced against each other's beaks and never seemed to strike at the body. There was a fairly rapid give and take, the bills clattering loudly against each other. These fencing toucans are among the more conspicuous birds of the island, particularly because of their call, a shrill frog-like cree which is repeated over and over again and can be heard half a mile away. The call is most frequent in the morning and late in the afternoon, but it stops abruptly at sunset. End of section 84section 85 of the strangest things in the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by mike manalakis the strangest things in the world by thomas henry breaks on plant life there is a break on plant development perhaps one of nature's most fundamental controls over surging life it is a relatively narrow band of light on the edge of the invisible infrared in the solar spectrum. Plant life, and through plants all life, is tied intimately to certain solar wave bands. It has long been recognized that the cornerstone of all life on Earth is the process of photosynthesis by which plants, through energy provided by sunlight, are able to synthesize carbohydrates from water and carbon dioxide taken from the air, Animals eat these carbohydrates, the basic food. Other animals eat the carbohydrate eaters, and thus the chain extends from the simplest organisms to man. But without some other process, the carbohydrates might be a formless mass. The second process is that which shapes a plant and controls development of stems, leaves, and blossoms. This may be a light effect second in importance only to photosynthesis itself. It requires very little solar energy. Smithsonian Institution experiments have demonstrated that the control is exercised by red light with a maximum of efficiency at wavelengths around 660 millimicrons, or millionths of millimeters. It has been demonstrated, however, that this formative action can be blocked effectively by irradiation with wavelengths in the far red. The greatest effect is at wavelengths between 710 and 730 millimicrons. The break is not applied immediately. The maximum efficiency of the far red energy occurs a little more than an hour after the plant is exposed to the formative wavelengths. The implication is that the action interferes with the development process by acting on some product, the formation of which is initiated by the shorter red wavelengths. The experiments have been carried out with seedlings of beans. In other experiments, it has been found that damage to plants from X-ray exposure, insofar as this results in breaking the bundles of genes or units of heredity, can be increased from 30 to 50 percent by previous exposure to about the same wave band of far red light that reverses the formative process. On the other hand, the increase in damage is nullified if the X-ray exposure is followed by exposure to the red wave band. Breaking of the chromosomes or strings of genes, is one of the first evidences of damage to living organisms by exposure to ionizing radiation. This breaking is responsible for some of the adverse hereditary effects concerning which there has been a great deal of discussion because of possible effects of the atomic bomb fallout. The experiments were carried out with pollen of flowers and root tips of beans where results are relatively easy to determine. End of section 85. Section 86 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Snails are the flowers of the sea. There are more than 80,000 kinds of snails in the world. They swim, jump, crawl, burrow, live at the bottom of the sea and in the tops of trees. They range in size from the house conch of Florida, two feet long, to animals hardly the size of a grain of sugar. About half of all species live in the seas. Most are bottom dwellers, unable to swim, but several spend their lives on the surface. One, the purple janthina, floats upside down on a raft of air bubbles, trapped in a special kind of mucus which it secretes. Others live permanently attached to seaweeds. Most abundant of the sea snails probably are the pteropods, or sea butterflies, which live several feet below the surface in daylight, but come to the top in countless hordes at night. In some places the sea bottom is littered many feet deep with their shells, of which there is almost constant rain as the animals die. Loveliest flowers of the sea are the nudibranches. Seldom has nature produced in either plants or animals such elaborate combinations of brilliant colors and decorative appendages as in the bodies of these shellless ocean snails. Although there are more than 2,000 species, they are among the least known of all sea creatures. One reason for this is that most of them are quite small, ranging from a fourth to a half inch in length. Their coloring hardly can be appreciated except under some magnification. Nowhere are they very abundant. Their habitats vary from close inshore to deep water, but they are most likely to be seen in pools left among shore rocks by receding tides. Their extremely elaborate color patterns may be protective, to some extent. It is known that certain species have the ability to change colors in response to changes in their environment. They become bright red, for example, when living in association with a red sponge. Even more decorative than the color patterns are the appendages, extensions of the skin and sometimes of the digestive tract, which take the forms of delicately modeled, almost microscopic plants. All these nudibranches are flesh-eating creatures, feeding chiefly on the sea anemones found on the sea bottom. Most of the anemones are equipped with thousands of so-called nematocysts, or stinging organs. These are microscopic, ball-shaped structures filled with a virulent poison. The same mechanism is best known in sea nettles. As soon as a nematocyst is exposed to any tension, it explodes, releasing this poison. The little sea snails have evolved the ability to swallow the poison balls without exploding them. They pass into the digestive tract, but are not digested. In some way, the nematocysts find their way through certain of the appendages growing out of the digestive organs to the outside of the body. There they are retained, and serve the sea snail in the same way they serve the sea anemone. The little creature becomes quite dangerous to any of its natural enemies. Among the most enthusiastic nudibranch collectors is the Emperor of Japan, who has discovered and described several new species. Some of his publications about them have been illustrated by leading Japanese artists and show the unearthly beauty of the creatures to the best advantage. End of section 86section 87 of the strangest things in the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by krista zaleski the strangest things in the world by thomas henry the brutal south pole birds the southernmost birds on earth the only higher animal except man and his dogs that go close to the south pole are the Antarctic skuas. They are fierce, brutal little killers. Dwellers in the Earth's most inhospitable habitat, they have been able to survive largely because of their extreme rapaciousness. All other Antarctic birds, such as the penguins, stay close to the shores of the desolate continent. The skua has been seen at least 300 miles inland, and occasionally may fly across the pole itself. These birds arrive on the coast of Antarctica about the middle of October, the beginning of the southern summer, after spending the winter north of the circle. Their arrival is timed to coincide with the egg-laying of the Adelie penguins. The skua's chief food consists of penguin eggs and chicks, which it devours by the hundreds. Scores of half-eaten, trampled bodies of young penguins always can be found during the hatching season, 
near the sites of penguin rookeries. The skua is hardly a match for the parent birds, but is an expert in separating chicks from the brood and killing them when they have no protection. It is a creature of relatively enormous strength and endurance, and flies long distances carrying chunks of meat bigger than itself. It also is an extremely noisy, quarrelsome creature, an outstanding example of the philosophy of every individual for itself. There is no brooding of chicks nor protecting them from the elements. The parents hardly bother to feed them. Little skuas, it is reported, come out of the eggs fighting. Usually there are two eggs to a nest. One chick probably is a trifle weaker than the other. In a short time, it is driven from the nest, killed and eaten by its rapacious brother or sister. It may even become the prey of its own hungry parents. Skuas also have the habit of eating their own eggs. This keeps the population within the limits of the food supply. End of section 87. Section 88 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jim Lauder. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Silk Bearded Clams. Jason's golden fleece may have been woven from the beard of a silk bearded clam. The same sort of cloth, in fact, still is produced on a small scale in Italy, chiefly for the tourist trade. A silk glove of modern manufacture now is in the Smithsonian collections. The clam is a giant Mediterranean species, the Pina marina. Its shell reaches a maximum length of about three feet, but the average is less than half this. From a gland in its foot it secretes milk-like strands with which it attaches itself to the sea bottom. These strands are as much as a foot long. The silk is of exceptionally fine quality. At least it was so regarded by the Arabs who maintained centers for manufacture of the cloth in Spain, Italy, and North Africa. Says one Arab author, At a certain time of the year an animal comes forth from the sea and rubs itself on the stones of the seashore. A down soft as silk with a golden color falls off it. It is fine and small, and garments are woven from it, which take on different colors during the day. The Umayyad kings of Spain used to put restrictions upon it so that it was only exported secretly. The price of a garment is more than 100 dinars, on account of its fineness and beauty. The value of a dinar, the gold coin of the Muslim world, is difficult to calculate in any present coinage, but it was at least the equivalent of a dollar. Says an Arab writer, I have seen how it is gathered. Divers dive into the sea and bring out tubers like onions with a kind of neck, which has hairs on the upper part. The tubers like onions burst and let forth hairs, which are combed and become like wool. They spin it and make a woof of it so as to pass a warp of silk through it. The most magnificent royal garments of Tunis are made of it. Gigantic clams, nearly five feet long and weighing more than 400 pounds, who raise crops of microscopic plants for their own sustenance, are among nature's fantasies found along Australia's Great Barrier Reef. These molluscan titans have formed a curious partnership with the zoazentale, a family of microscopic algae. The plants live as parasites in the blood cells of the inner lobe of the clam's mantle. Upon this mantle is a lens-like structure which looks like an eye. These mollusks, however, are blind as any other clams, and the eye-like protuberances, it has been determined, are only windows by which light is emitted to the parasitic algae within the blood cells. The surplus of algae is carried by the bloodstream to the clam's digestive organs, where it serves as food. Another giant clam, the Tridacna of East Indian seas, may weigh up to 600 pounds. The monsters constitute a peril for divers who unwittingly step inside the open valves. These snap shut, imprisoning the diver's foot, and, unless he can get help, he is held in the trap and drowned. End of section 88 Section 89 of The Strangest Things in the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright.
The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Pearls Grow in Brooks Excellent pearls occur occasionally in freshwater clams. A pearl of perfect form and pure color was found in such a clam taken from a brook near Patterson, New Jersey in 1857. It sold at Tiffany's for $1,000 and shortly afterwards was resold in Paris for $2,200. This started pearl hunts in brooks all over the country. On the arrival of Europeans in Florida, Louisiana, and Virginia, fabulous legends were circulated about the enormous treasures to be obtained by plundering Indian graves. A contemporary chronicler of the audacious De Soto expedition reported that the conquistador got 350 pounds of fine pearls at the creek town of Cofetejaque on the Savannah River. A member of the first Virginia colony gathered together from among the savage people about 5,000, of which number he chose so many as made a fair chain, which for their likeness and uniformity, in roundness, orientness, and piedness, of many excellent colors, with equalities in greatness, were very fair and rare. The supply, however, was quite limited. Indian pearls were the subject of special study by the late Dr. William H. Holmes. The majority of those obtained, he reported, were ruined as jewels by the heat employed in opening the shellfish from which they were abstracted. Many of the larger specimens probably were not real pearls, but polished beads cut from the nacre of seashells and quite worthless as gems. It has been found that the real pearls were obtained from bivalve shells, from the oyster along the seashore and in tidewater inlets, and from the mussel on the shores of lakes and rivers. But the very general use of pearls by the pre-Columbian natives is amply attested. More than 60,000, nearly two pecks, were obtained, drilled, and undrilled from a single burial mound near Madisonville, Ohio. End of section 89。Section 90 of the Strangest Things in the World。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Grasshopper Infested Glaciers Among America's natural curiosities are grasshopper glaciers. These are great masses of glacial ice containing layers of embedded frozen grasshoppers. Such layers are probably remnants of vast migrations which have taken place at irregular intervals over several centuries. Great hordes of the insects either flew over the glacier or were carried there by winds and while there sudden snowstorms or cold air rising from the ice field caused them to drop. They were embedded so quickly in the falling snow, which later became ice, that they have remained perfectly preserved for centuries. The most notable of these glaciers is in the Beartooth Mountains of Montana. Others have been reported from the high mountains of Africa. End of section 90. Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 28th of February, 2022. Section 91 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Monster Clams of Polynesia. Largest of clams and largest of all shellfish is a native of Polynesian seas. The two halves may weigh as much as 500 pounds. The flesh is eaten raw by natives. The interior of the shell is like polished marble, such shells frequently were used as founts for holy water in European churches. A particularly large one attracted much attention in the church of St. Sulpice in Paris. 
Such clams are found at depths up to 17 fathoms. They fasten themselves to rocks by a process so tough that it can only be severed with an axe. End of section 91. Section 92 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Corals Combine Plants and Animal Life. A coral reef is a gigantic plant animal. It is a community of countless billions of plants and countless billions of animals which act as a single organism, like the countless millions of specialized cells that make up the body of a man or a mouse. It is probably the most efficient of all earthly creatures. It is self-sufficient, creating its own constant food supply. It is essentially immortal. It is hungry like an animal. It is motionless like a plant. It is both and combines the attributes of both. It is the largest and most enduring of all creatures of land or sea. The animals are coral polyps. They are tiny worm-like organisms with mouths surrounded by constantly probing tentacles. They are rapacious and insatiable. They are essentially voraciously hungry stomachs. Bloodless, brainless, sightless, heartless. The polyps are close to the bottom of animal life, vaguely related to the white, stinging sea nettles which are the scourges of summer beaches. These little creatures extract lime from seawater and secrete for themselves limestone houses, the bones of the superorganism. Out of these they have built up islands and almost subcontinents. Sharing their limestone cells are quite unrelated organisms, single-celled plants, or algae. These plants possess the green of grass and forests, whose molecules create out of carbon dioxide and water through the energy of captured sunlight, starches and sugars which are the fuel of animal life. This process of photosynthesis is the cornerstone of all life on Earth. Thus the plants feed their partner animals. The excretion of the animals, in turn, provides the essential fertilizer of the plants. Considering the coral reef as a superorganism, one might almost say that it eats itself but loses nothing in the process. A reef, considered as a superorganism, represents about the last word in nature's efficiency. It has been found, for example, that one acre of coral reef produces about 74,000 pounds of sugar a year, a record barely reached by man on his most efficiently managed plantations. All this sugar is devoured by the polyps. Apparently, the fertility of the surrounding sea makes little difference. Coral reefs flourish in parts of the ocean that are essentially deserts. A marine biological laboratory has been established by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission to study the effects of the radiation from nuclear explosions on plant-animal populations. The first requirement has been to determine the natural condition of the organisms before being subjected to this radiation. Then, whatever changes take place with subsequent bomb tests can be noted. The work has been undertaken by biologists of Duke University and the University of Georgia. Such a life community, both a vast assembly of organisms and a sort of superorganism, is an almost perfect subject for the required observations. The first job, according to the commission report, has been to measure the basal metabolism of the reef as a whole. Admittedly, the conception of a reef as a sort of superorganism is somewhat mystical. The Duke and University of Georgia biologists do not maintain that there is any consciousness of constituting a whole on the part of the individual organisms. It is likely that they have no consciousness of anything. The outstanding fact is that they behave so much like a whole. A reef is an outstanding example of the two major divisions of life, plant and animal, working in perfect cooperation. The actual cooperation of plant and animal in an integrated organism is not unique for the coral reefs. Something of the sort occurs in certain sea worms, near the bottom of the worm family, that grow green algae in their bloodstreams. These worms make some of the beaches of Normandy grass green in summer. The algae are necessary for their existence. There may be a few other examples throughout the animal kingdom. End of section 92. Read by Winston Smith. Section 93 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. 
The First Engineers Termites Termite civilization probably has reached its greatest heights in architecture and engineering. Australian mounds, built by workers out of earth particles cemented together by a salivary gland secretion, are steeple-shaped, as much as 20 feet high, and with bases 12 feet in diameter. Hundreds of such structures may be scattered over a few acres. Such an assemblage looks like a large native village, although architecturally the structures are far beyond the abilities of primitive man. The common type consists of a solid, hard outer wall which has the strength of superfine concrete. It is almost impossible to break through this material. Immediately inside are numerous thin walled passages and galleries. Below these, at the ground level and about in the center, are the quarters of king and queen and the nursery. From the mound, passages for the food foragers lead in all directions through the soil. A mound two feet high will house approximately two million individuals. Long before architects, termites developed the art of air conditioning. Proper humidity inside the nest is essential to the existence of the soft-bodied workers. The majority of species, however, are found in latitudes with long, dry seasons. To meet such conditions, the insects achieved humidity control in various ways still not understood. Notable are the structures of the Australian compass termites, who erect dwellings 8 to 12 feet high with flattened sides. The broad ends always point east and west, the narrow ends north and south. These nests are strong enough to support the stamping of wild bulls. A group of them looks like a particularly well-constructed native village, or the site of some extinct human civilization. Apparently the precise orientation of the nests is associated with prevailing winds, and in some way contributes to maintaining a constant humidity. The blind creatures seem to have developed special sense organs, unknown to man and probably unique in the animal kingdom. One of these is reportedly a brain barometer, which is extremely sensitive to slight humidity changes. Both soldiers and workers respond with military precision to any threat to their neighbors, this believed due to an extreme sensitivity to vibration. Few varieties of termites can endure sunshine. Some construct paper-like umbrellas, which they carry with them when they come above ground. One species on Barro, Colorado Island in the Panama Canal Zone, which attacks live trees, first builds a thin earth crust around the trunk, seven to eight feet from the earth. Beneath this crust, they seek out weak spots in wood, which enable them to penetrate into the heart of the tree. Termite armies, in distinction from those of ants, serve only as defensive forces. There are two kinds of soldiers. Some are equipped with enormous jaws with which to rend to the enemy. These are so tenacious that when the body is torn away from the prey, the mandibles remain in place. Others are the bayonet men and chemical warfare troops. These fighters have a protrusion on the front of the head, which looks like a long nose, but which actually has developed from a primitive eye. From this protrusion, a sticky acid is exuded. In rare instance, it may be spurted a short distance, an inch or less. These soldiers fight battles to the death with warlike ants which invade their nests. The termite warrior rams with his nose-like organ, the so-called pedicle of the ant, the narrowest part of its body, smearing it with the liquid. This never has been completely analyzed. It is a powerful acid, but is not the well-known formic acid exuded by ants. It has strong corrosive properties when applied to metals. It has a pungent odor, which, however, is characteristic of all termites and the ancestral cockroaches. Between ants and termites, there is a perpetual war. Army ants especially try to raid termite nests to feed on the young whenever they can find any crack in the walls through which they can squeeze their bodies. But when there is any break in the nest, the termite soldiers immediately arrange themselves in a circle around the opening, while workers bring up little slabs of earth from the interior to patch the wall. Most common of the Barrow, Colorado species are the ameterms, which build hemisphere-shaped red mounds about two feet in diameter. These are made of tiny particles of earth which have passed through the alimentary tracts of the insects where they are coated with a cement-like material. Such a nest is impervious to water. It is so sturdy that a heavy man can jump up and down on it without breaking the roof. It cannot be broken open with a machete. Another common species build the so-called niggerhead nests, about the size of footballs, on fence posts and trees, especially dead trees whose stumps protrude out of Gatun Lake. These nests are also extremely sturdy. They are made of a mixture of earth grains and finely digested wood. From such a nest, numerous runways traverse the trunk, sometimes connecting with smaller colonial niggerheads. End of section 93. Read by Winston Smith.
Section 94 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Oyster Oddities. An oyster can change its sex several times during its life. This has been determined by Dr. Paul Galtsoff of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by observing an experimental colony. In the first year, 8% of the males changed to females, and 13% of the females became males. In the second year, 11% of the males changed sex, and 12% of the females. One sex change, Dr. Galtsoff found, makes the same individual more likely to undergo another. A single Pacific Coast oyster produces approximately 10 billion descendants a year. If all survived in five generations, they would constitute a mass eight times the size of the world. Clams and oysters appear to be about the most stupid animals in creation. Actually, each has three brains, or nerve ganglia. One controls the feeding apparatus, another the viscera, and a third the utilization of oxygen. End of section 94. Section 95 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The World's Biggest Sneeze The sneeze of the elephant has been described as like the bursting of a boiler of considerable size. When the elephant feels the onset of one of these titanic eruptions, it appears to realize that a momentous event is about to take place. It becomes extremely restless and is seemingly unable to stand still for a moment. The sneeze is preceded by a tremendous wall-shaking bellow. Although elephants are subject to frequent colds, the sneeze is a rare phenomenon. For this reason, it is regarded as a good luck sign, especially among Muslims of India who gather around and wait patiently for the event. When it starts, they bow their heads and pray for the realization of their wishes. End of section 95The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Luminescent Tenophores Read by Christian Aboko This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There are windless nights when Caribbean waters seem like fields of green fireflies. This is due to the vast numbers of luminescent tenophores, or comb bearers. One of the most abundant and least known forms of animal life, they are also among the most delicate. Although they are related to the planarian worm and the jellyfish, they are quite unique. Superficially, they seem little more than animate bags of water, with skins thinner than most delicate tissue paper. They abound in staggering numbers over most of the world. One of the most familiar types is the American Nemeopsis. On calm summer days, the amber-green species sometimes covers completely thousands of square yards of sea like a raft formed of millions of individuals floating just below the surface. A classic ground for this phenomenon is Narragansett Bay. Like the rest of its race, the tenophore is like a fragment of moonlight on the sea. It is so fragile that the slightest current of water in its neighbourhood is sufficient to tear it to bits. It is about as elusive as moonlight. When grasped gently, the jelly-like substance slides through the fingers, 
taken in a net and placed in salt water, it vanishes completely on the way from boat to laboratory. Intact specimens are almost unknown in scientific collections. Ordinarily, they live at considerable depths in the zone of absolute calm, where all wave movement ceases. Great hordes rise to be the surface only on nights, when the surface of the ocean is like a sheet of glass. They are among the loveliest of all sea creatures. The delicacy of their colouring is that of spring arbutus, or anemone. Their presence is indicated chiefly by the brilliant flashes of rainbow colours as they pass a few inches below the surface. The majority are pear-shaped. Giant of the race is Venus's girdle, best known in the Mediterranean, but found most in subtropical seas and sometimes swept as far north as the coast of New England. It is an undulating, iridescent ribbon as much as five feet long and two inches wide. The Nemeopsis of southern New England waters is ball-shaped, with a diameter of about four inches. Tenophores are most varied in the Bay of Naples. There, 18 species have been identified. There are 14 species now known in the Caribbean. In absolute numbers, however, the fragile creatures are most abundant in North Atlantic and sub-Arctic waters, where because of ordinarily rough seas, they are seldom seen. There, they constitute one of the major menaces of the cod fisheries. Despite their fragility, they are vicious little animals, devouring cod eggs and fry in incalculable numbers. Each living water bag has a slit-like mouth on top, and what apparently is a sense organ of some kind on the bottom. The minute struggling prey are seized in two pincer-like tentacles and pushed into the mouth. They are digested quickly by the juices in the water sac, in which float about whatever vital organs the tenophore possesses. The tenophores are by no means aberrant jellyfish, which they resemble only in the extreme tenuousness of their bodies. They have no umbrellas and no stinging cells. Two forms are known which have flattened bodies like planarian worms and which creep on the sea floor. Because of various similarities in the development of both creatures, some zoologists believe they are immediate descendants of an unknown common ancestor. The function of their weird green luminescence is unknown. It would seem of questionable value in attracting prey, and it is difficult to imagine that these most fragile and evanescent of Earth's creatures have any sort of love life. Nevertheless, Light-making seems to constitute a purposeful part of their activities. End of section 96。section 97 of the strangest things in the world。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。read by ben tucker。The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Forest That Time Forgot Knee-high red and pink ferns fill the jungle hollow. Around them are green leaves covered with parallel white lines and sets of five, with dots on the lines which look like notes of music. These leaves are known as music paper. There is no record that anybody has tried to play the tunes nature has written on them. Mixed with them are sandpaper leaves, with surfaces so rough that they are used locally for the same purpose as sheets of sandpaper elsewhere. Sinister Hingman's ropes swing, as if awaiting their victims from branches along the jungle paths. Such are a few random notes from a cloudland jungle. In many ways like a forest of prehistoric days, in Venezuela's Henry Pitier National Forest. Here flourishes the giant tree fern, most characteristic tree of the vast ancient forests from which coal deposits were formed. In the tree fern fronds lurk worms and amphibians not vastly different from the tree creatures of the Devonian geological era. This is a forest of the central tropics. Paradoxically, it is also, when seen from a little distance, a New England forest of late September with groves of straight white-trunked palm trees, which look like birches and patches of flame color in the treetops, which look like maple leaves starting to put on their autumn coloring. The temperature, in fact, is about that of a warm autumn day in New England. 
especially as dusk comes and a white veil of mist rolls over the mountaintops from the sea. The patches of flame color which look like maple leaves are orange and red blossoms of the galito or cockflowers, so called because the bloom resembles so much the body of a miniature rooster. The galito appears high in the treetops. It is about the most abundant and conspicuous flower of the cloud jungle. It grows on big gray-trunked trees whose bark looks like a rough woven linen. Each blooming tree is filled with brilliantly colored hummingbirds and red and green parrots. Trees in the high jungle hills wear thick green overcoats of moss and lichens. There is one dark green form of moss which grows about an inch high and looks like a miniature cedar leaf. Many of the older trees, especially palms, are rusty with species of red lichen, which spread rapidly over the trunks. Among them is a blossoming tree with a straight spined gray trunk from 30 to 40 feet high, which is a close relative of the potato. The cloud forest is predominantly the home of the epiphytes, such as long dangling masses of red, pink, and pearl orchids which grow on the trees. They require plenty of moisture. In this mountain swamp, the trees always are soaking wet. This is an ideal environment for the eight or ten varieties of moss which grow so luxuriantly. There are green-walled cave openings ten feet high and ten feet wide in the bottoms of the trunks of giant trees. Exposed roots lie across the paths, covered with moss in which there are leprous white spots. They look like enormous, writhing, malevolent green serpents. End of section 97、Number、Section 98 of the Strangest Things in the World. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Versatility of the Elephant's Trunk. The elephant's trunk is a tool surpassed in effectiveness only by the hand of man. It is a muscular prolongation of combined nose and upper lip, which have grown together. It is associated closely with the motor and sensory centers in the brain cortex. And is under such delicate voluntary control that, with its enormous strength, is combined extreme finesse of movement. The trunk terminates in one of two finger-like projections, which seem capable of almost as delicate voluntary movements as our human fingers. The trunk is a supernose. As a sensory organ, it is the elephant's chief means of securing information about his environment. With it, the animal can detect the direction and perhaps the distance. Of olfactory stimuli from all sorts of sources, it is as vital in an elephantine scheme of things as are eyes to a human being. The trunk is the elephant's chief servant. Without it, the monster is the equivalent of a blind man. It has approximately forty thousand muscles and a highly developed sensory and motor nerve supply. The organ has enormous strength, sufficient to tear up a tree by its roots. Here are some of the things the animal is credited with being able to do with the trunk: pick up a pin from the ground, select and secure a single tussock of appetizing herbage, uncork a wine bottle, untie a slip knot, unbolt a gate, throw up and catch a baseball, pull the trigger to fire a gun, ring a bell. A female elephant owned by the Duke of Devonshire in the 1880s was allowed almost a free range over the park of his estate. She made herself useful by sweeping the paths with a broom, and by carrying a garden watering pot. Her most celebrated achievement was that of opening a tightly corked wine bottle. She would hold it against the ground at about a forty-five degree angle with one of her front feet, and gradually twist out the cork, barely protruding above the neck of the bottle, with her trunk. After emptying the contents into her mouth, she would hand the empty bottle to her keeper. End of section ninety-eight. Section ninety-nine of the strangest things in the world. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The strangest things in the world by Thomas Henry. Fiendish vampires of the night. About the middle of the eighteenth century, 
belief in vampirism spread like an epidemic across France and England. Dead men hellishly condemned to live forever came out of their sepulchres at midnight, took the forms of various animals, and feasted on the blood of the living, who in turn died and became vampires. This was a superstition which previously had been confined largely to Slavic countries. Its influence in France and England seems to have started with tales brought back from the New World by Spanish explorers of actual vampires, sinister, black-winged, fiend-faced flying mammals, who actually fed on the blood of sleeping humans. Thenceforth, the popular conception of a vampire was that of a large bat hovering over the unsuspecting, eternally doomed sleeper. The stories, doubtless, were greatly ornamented and exaggerated. However, the vampire bat of the American tropics is a gruesome reality. It is now known to be a carrier of the rabies virus. It is a small brown bat condemned by nature to live exclusively on blood. Its throat is too small to swallow solid particles. Its stomach is especially adapted for rapid digestion. It feasts on all sorts of mammals, including man, and the incisions of its razor-sharp teeth are so nearly painless that a sleeper seldom is awakened. Supposedly, it always bites man on the bottom of the toes. The loathsome little creature does not actually suck blood as long was supposed. Instead, according to observers, it laps up blood with its tongue. Its saliva is believed to contain an anticoagulant, which keeps a wound bleeding for hours. From 20 to 25 minutes is required for a meal during which the animal gorges itself until its body becomes spherical. We slept so soundly, records an Amazon explorer. It was not until morning we discovered that we had been raided during the night by vampire bats, and the whole party was covered with blood stains from the many bites. It may seem unreasonable to the uninitiated that we could have been thus bitten and not disturbed in our sleep, but the fact remains that there is no pain produced at the time of the bite, nor for several hours afterwards. It feeds only at night, like most New World tropical bats. It sleeps during the day in total darkness of caverns, where it hangs in clusters from the ceilings. Such a bat cave, about as gruesome a place as could be found on Earth, was explored a few years ago by Dr. Raymond L. Dittmars of the American Museum of Natural History. This cave, which the bat shared with scorpions, who had wing spreads of five inches, was found in the Chagres Valley of Panama. The mammal has a strikingly spider-like appearance. Probably alone among bats, it can walk as a quadruped, using its wings as front feet. That, of course, is what they were originally before the grotesque creatures invaded the air. End of section 99 Section number 100 of The Strangest Things in the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Remarkable Orchids A flower that opens only in moonlight is one of Venezuela's plant curiosities. It is an ivory-white, velvety orchid with a dazzling blossom. For full fertilization, it depends entirely on nocturnal butterflies which sip nectar while pollinization takes place. This curious flower is one of approximately 800 orchid species, some of them among the most beautiful in the world, which grow in Venezuela. Among these is probably the prettiest and rarest of all orchids, the mother-of-pearl flower, which can be found, and then only rarely, in the Gran Sabana country at altitudes of more than 3,000 feet. Only a few specimens ever have been brought out by collectors. Another high mountain variety has square petals with fringed edges. Found in the jungles of the upper Orinoco is an orchid with blossoms measuring up to 16 inches in diameter. A completely unique orchid has been found growing in water. All other species live as parasites on trees or rocks or in the soil like other plants. Throughout the world, there are more than 20,000 species of orchids, the great majority of which are found only in the mountainous regions of the tropics. A few, however, can be found growing as far north as the Arctic Circle. End of section number 100, read by Kevin Waters, Spring Hill, Florida, February the 15th, 2022.
Section 101 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Nature's Insecticide, the Millipede. Far less malevolent than the centipede, and probably a somewhat more primitive form of animal life, is the millipede, or thousand legs. It is a strictly vegetarian creature that lives under stones, logs, or in rotting tree trunks, and feeds on soft roots, leaves, and fruits. Millipedes are seldom seen. They shun light, although in the tropics they sometimes come out of their retreats after heavy rains and crawl over the ground. The animal has 20 to 40 legs, two pair on each segment of the body, a characteristic in which it differs striking from the centipedes to whom it is only distantly related. Movement is in an almost mathematically straight line, with a series of wave-like undulations in which, apparently, all the legs on one side of the body move in unison. All millipedes are essentially blind. Their eyes are able only to distinguish light from dark, but as they crawl, every inch of their path is explored by their delicately sensitive antenna. So secretive is their life that relatively little is known of their behavior. The female of one European species burrows in the earth, moistens bits of soil with a sticky fluid from the salivary glands in her mouth, and thus makes tiny bricks. These she builds into the form of a hollow sphere, about the size of a walnut with a hole in the top, through which she lays from fifty to a hundred eggs. Others lay their eggs in bunches in the soil and coil around them until they hatch. Mothers may even remain with the young for a few days. The bite of the millipede, unlike that of the centipede, is not poisonous, but the animal has stink glands from which a foul-smelling liquid containing the extremely poisonous prussic acid is exuded. This presumably affords an adequate protection against driver ants and birds, the natural enemies. The secretion is so powerful that a couple of millipedes placed in a can kill insects as effectively as a small dose of potassium cyanide. One member of the race, Spirobolus marginatus, as much as four inches long and with a body made up of 57 segments, is fairly common under logs in the northeastern United States. At certain seasons, these creatures become restless, leave the soil, and come into houses. They may swarm in basements and on ground floors. They crawl up walls and drop from ceilings. These invasions usually take place in the autumn and presumably are associated with migrations to find winter quarters. In some cottages surrounded by trees, as many as 700 have been counted in a room in one evening. However embarrassing to hosts, it must be realized that millipedes never bite and that they do no damage to furniture. The only accusation yet made against them refers to one species, the so-called greenhouse millipede, which may cause considerable damage to potted plants. In emergencies, the millipede is able to roll itself in a tight ball like its presumed ancestors, the primeval trilobites. In one Madagascan species, this ball is as big as a golf ball. Some millipedes are less than a twentieth of an inch long. Gigantic millipedes are known from the tree fern swamps of the Carboniferous Geological Period when the Great Coal Deposits were formed. They were about a foot long, and their bodies were covered with long, sharp spines. This apparently was to make them distasteful to the giant amphibians, remotely related to present-day frogs and toads, who were the dominant four-footed animals in the world at the time. Thus, the millipede has almost a lengthy history on Earth as the more insect-like cockroach of those same forests of 250 million years age. End of section 101. Read by Winston Smith. Section number 102 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Bats have built-in radar. Bats see with their ears echoes of sound and audible to man enable the flying mammals to find their way through the almost absolute darkness of deep cavern or jungle. These creatures might be considered inventors of the navy sonar device by which underwater obstacles are located by echoes or even in a sense of radar. Almost entirely creatures of night and late twilight Bats have small and poorly developed eyes. 
When one is on the wing, it emits an almost constant succession of inaudible squeaks at a sound frequency of between 25,000 and 70,000 vibrations a second. The human hearing range reaches only to 30,000. Each squeak, according to measurements by Dr. Donald R. Griffin of Cornell University, lasts about two hundredths of a second. In ordinary flight over open country, it is repeated about ten times a second. By means of the echoes, it apparently is possible to detect and avoid any obstacle, even one as small as a strand of silk thread strung across the path within a distance of 10 or 12 feet. The bat does not hear its own squeaks. Each time one is uttered, an ear muscle contracts automatically, thus momentarily shutting off the sound itself so that only the echo can be heard. It is possible that each animal has its individual sound pattern and is guided only by its own echoes. Otherwise, it would seem, there would be complete confusion from the echoes of several hundred bats moving in a flock. Largest of the bats are northern India's flying foxes. The body is shaped almost precisely like that of a small fox and is covered with fine, dark brown hair. The wing spread is about three feet. These flying foxes move in flocks of thousands. They are exclusively fruit eaters and forest dwellers. They are the only bats eaten by man. Their flesh is said to resemble chicken. Insect-eating bats are prisoners of the air. Once on the wing, they must remain in flight all night until they return to the dark caves where they sleep all day, suspended head downwards. Flying from dusk to dawn requires an enormous amount of energy for which a lot of food is required. One of these animals probably must eat about a third of its own weight in insects each night. Thus, it is a good friend of the farmer and one of the potent factors in keeping the balance of nature. If a bat lit on the ground or on any solid object, it would be very difficult, perhaps impossible, to get it on the wing again. This is accomplished only by falling from its sleeping place. The hibernation of temperate zone bats appears very close to complete lifelessness and is probably the most death-like sleep experience by any mammal. Animals close to a cave entrance have been found completely coated with ice as moisture has congealed on the fur. Yet when they wake in the spring, they appear none the worse for the experience. End of section number 102, read by Kevin Waters, Spring Hill, Florida, February the 15th, 2022. Section number 103 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Crabs that Climb Trees A fantastic race of small, pale hermit crabs are the most numerous and conspicuous animal inhabitants of war-wrecked Pacific Islands. The multitudes of these crustaceans may have a considerable role, beneficial and otherwise, in present efforts to cover these white, sand waste with grass and trees. Of all creatures which start life in the sea, hermit crabs have become best adapted to continual existence on land. Like others of their race, they are shellless and soft-bodied. For protection against enemies and against being dried out by the glaring sun, they live in houses, the abandoned shells of other sea creatures which have been cast ashore. They carry their houses on their backs. When a crab outgrows its shelter, it moves to a larger one, changing its dwelling four or five times during a normal lifetime. There is never any housing shortage for those in the small stages of growth. However, the sole refuge for the crab, which has reached full size, is the cat's eye. The shell of a marine snail as much as three inches in diameter, 
with an opalescent pink inner lining which glistens like the eye of a cat. Only the hermits which can find such shells survive. In searching for food, the crabs climb the trunks and branches of koo trees which grow all over the Pacific Islands. They eat the bark along the upper side of the branches. Most trees show long scars which are the results of past injuries. A common habit, especially of the undersized individuals, is cleverly to tear off and eat only the ovaries and stamens of blossoming plants. These are certainly not isolated acts, says a Pacific Science Board report, but once perfected by practice and perhaps instinct. The crabs probably decimate the flora, feeding particularly on tender seedlings. They largely are responsible for the paucity of different kinds of plants on some islands. The seeds of any new kinds of plants washing to its shores are subject to their inspection and, if palatable, sacrificed to their appetite. The foreign plants now being introduced as seeds and seedlings must not only surmount the drastic condition of drought and salinity, but also the hurdle of these ferocious animals. In the spring, the females carry their numerous maroon-colored eggs attached to their abdomens. When do they return to the ocean to allow these eggs to hatch their free-swimming larvae that resemble so closely the shrimp-like ancestor of all hermit crabs? Where do they throw off the hard, non-expanding shells they have requisitioned as they increase in size, in burrows, on land, or in the ocean? How, with gills adapted for respiration in water, have they perfected respiration on land? Questions such as these are still unanswered. End of section number 103, read by Kevin Waters, Spring Hill, Florida, February the 15th, 2022. Section 104 of The Strangest Things in the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Ferocious Centipede Natives of Brazil call the centipede the ambua. These creatures of a thousand legs some of which are more than a foot long, bend as they crawl along and are reckoned very poisonous. In their going, it is observable that on each side of their bodies, every leg has its motion, one regularly after the other. Being numerous, their legs have a kind of undulation and thereby communicate to the body a swifter progression than one would imagine, where so many short feet are to take so many short steps that follow one another, rolling on like waves of the sea. The 18th century British naturalist Charles Owen was not alone in considering the millipedes and centipedes as kinds of snakes, nor in being confused, as naturalists still are, at their curious, complicated way of moving. There had been highly exaggerated reports. The Spaniard Ulloa, Columbus's gold assayer, described some centipedes he saw on the northern coast of South America as a yard long and six inches wide. Their bite, he contended, was fatal. In the Kubokale Valley, reported British naturalist H.S. Woods in 1935, I saw a centipede ten inches long. Its general color was electric blue with bright coral red fangs. It was the most terrible thing I have seen in my tramps through the forest. Wood was stung by one of these Indian centipedes. He described the sensation as exactly like that of a third-degree burn. These animals are neither snakes, insects, nor worms. They constitute an independent and intermediate order of animal life. They are considered a little nearer to the spiders than to true insects. They have retained the ways of life of the ancestral worm. Most of the centipedes are active, ferocious, flesh-eating animals. Their poison fangs are deadly to their normal prey, earthworms and insects. Some of the larger species do not hesitate to attack lizards and small mice. A bite, however painful, probably never is fatal to a human. 
All are land animals which creep or crawl under logs and bark. They usually remain in seclusion during the day, but come out of their retreats at night when they wander over the ground and attract attention to themselves by their phosphorescence. A few have been described as sea dwellers, but they do not actually live in the water. They crawl along the shore and are submerged by each tide. Some are completely blind, others have many eyes. The centipedes are among the most repulsive of all animals, yet there are accounts of South American Indian children who drag very large ones out of the earth and eat them. Religious fanatics among the North African Arabs swallow them alive as proof of their supernatural powers. Tropical America has many varieties with varied and curious habits, like the Nicaraguan species described by Thomas Belt. Among the centipedes was one which had a singular method of securing prey. It is about three inches long and sluggish in its movements, but from its tubular mouth it is able to discharge a viscid fluid to a distance of about three inches, which stiffens with exposure to the air to the consistency of a spider's web, but stronger. With it, it can envelop and capture its prey, just as a fowler throws his net over a bird. Some of the other centipedes have phosphorescent spots in the head, which shine brightly at night, casting a greenish light for a little distance in front of them. I think these lights may serve to dazzle or allure the insects on which they prey. Centipedes have been observed attacking earthworms. One may grapple with its victim for several hours before killing it. Then it sucks the blood. A fairly familiar visitor in the southern United States is a house centipede, which thrives in damp basements and sometimes invades ground floors. It is a worm-like creature, about an inch long, with fifteen pairs of long legs. In the female, the last pair are twice as long as the rest of the body. The animal is yellowish-gray with white bands on its legs. It is poisonous, but its jaws are weak and it seldom bites human beings. Despite the evil reputation of its race, this centipede should be a welcome guest, for it feeds on cockroaches, flies, spiders, moths, and other domestic pests. It is a fast runner, but often stops suddenly, remains absolutely motionless for a moment, and then darts for concealment. End of section 104. Read by Laura Leith, New Orleans, Louisiana. March 13, 2022. Section number 105 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Plant That Makes Men Dumb. A plant now being cultivated in the newly established botanical garden of the University of Caracas may prove to be nature's greatest boon to pestered husbands and harassed mothers. It is described only under the popular Spanish name of Planta del Mudo. It looks like sugar cane. According to reliable reports, anybody who chews the stem is stricken dumb for 48 hours. Other curiosities of the garden include a plant which allegedly can stimulate hair growth on bald heads and a bush whose blossoms open snow white in the morning and turn red at noon. Here also blooms the exotic queen of night, a climbing cactus with a white flower, five inches in diameter, which opens at sunset and closes at sunrise. End of section number 105, read by Kevin Waters, Spring Hill, Florida, February the 15th, 2022. Section number 106 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Scourge of the Earth, Locusts. From the days of the Hebrews' prophets, a visitation of locusts has been considered one of the plagues of God. A migration of millions of these grasshopper-like insects in clouds obscuring the sun leaves behind a countryside devastated as though by fire. 
In flight, they sound like a forest fire being spread by a brisk wind. Whenever they come to earth, areas of hundreds of square yards almost immediately are denuded of everything green. In history, their raids have been associated chiefly with the Near East. Quite similar creatures have caused far-reaching destruction over most of the world, including the United States. The last such phenomenon was about 1880. Since then, grasshoppers have hopped, not flown. There have been some great invasions, but the insects have moved along the ground where it is easier to combat them. The reason for the transformation was found a few years ago by entomologists. Hopping grasshoppers are changed into flying grasshoppers by heat and hunger, grown in test cages at high temperatures and deprived of succulent green food, the insects acquired longer wings, became slimmer, and took on brighter colors. It apparently is a curious provision of nature to preserve the grasshopper race. When on the edge of perishing, they are supplied with wings to carry them to green pastures a few hundred miles away. Lately, there's been some indication that those in the western United States might again enter the flying phase in the near future. During the great drought of the early 30s, there was a stimulus almost sufficient to make them undergo the complete transformation. At present, there seems little prospect that there will be another flying cloud in this part of the world. By planting cultivated crops on land formerly covered by grass, man provides good egg-laying grounds and plenty of green food. Adequate information still is lacking on what makes grasshoppers increase and decrease. Also a mystery is the mechanism by which the harmless, solitary phase is transformed into the dangerous, gregarious phase. Several types occur in both phases, and each can change itself into the other, altering their habits so that they attack in mass rather than as individuals. During the late 1870s, the flying clouds caused terror all over the world. In parts of Minnesota where the locusts landed, they covered the ground three inches thick. Crops were destroyed throughout the prairie states. The most remarkable incident was reported from Russia in 1878. A detachment of General Lazarov's expedition against the Turkomans met with a curious misadventure near the Georgian town of Eliza Vitopol. A few versts from the town, the soldiers encountered an army of locusts about 20 miles long and broad in proportion. The officer in charge did not like to turn back, repelled by mere insects. The soldiers soon were surrounded. The locusts appeared to have mistaken them for trees and swarmed by the thousands around them, crawling over their bodies, lodging themselves in their helmets, penetrating their clothes and knapsacks, filling the barrels of their rifles, and boring into their ears and noses. The commander gave the order for the troops to push on the double quick for Eliza Vitopol, but the road was so blocked that the soldiers became frightened and after they wavered a few minutes, a stampede took place. Led by a non-commissioned officer who had espoused the village a short way from the road, the troops dashed across the fields, slipping about on the crushed and greasy bodies as if on ice. They were detained prisoners by the insects for 45 hours, and on the way to a laser vita pole, found every blade of grass and green leaf destroyed. That same year, a cross-continental train was held up for three hours near Reno, Nevada, by a host of locusts that covered the rails for several miles. End of section number 106, read by Kevin Waters, Spring Hill, Florida, February the 15th, 2022. Section 107 of The Strangest Things in the World. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Trees can grow smaller. Trees change size from hour to hour. The circumference of a tree trunk gets bigger and smaller with unpredictable perversity. For light on this phenomenon, the world is indebted to Dr. John A. Small of Rutgers University. About a decade ago, tree scientists were provided with an instrument which could measure continuously the radial growth of a tree with an accuracy of a thousandth of an inch. With such an instrument, it seemed plausible that it would be possible to tell just how much a tree had grown in a single day and its rates of growth in different seasons. A lot of the conclusions reached in this connection must now be discarded. The circumference of a tree certainly changes, but not in a straight line. It may be bigger one day, smaller the next. Dr. Small's experiments were carried out with a white ash. He found that circumference changes followed yearly, monthly, and even daily rhythms, but the changes in the same tree might vary by as much as 200% when measurements were made at different times. Daily variations have shown a tendency to reach maximum readings about 6.30 a.m. and sink to minimum in the late afternoon or early evening. Eccentric jumps and drops can be found almost any time. End of section 107「Section number 108 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julia Seaton. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Underworld Cities. Seventeen-year locusts build great subterranean cities during their long sojourn in the Earth's depths. The years underground are by no means a resting period, an episode of being buried alive. All the time the young locusts, in various metamorphoses, are busy building and eating. The eggs of the strange insects are laid during a few weeks late in summer inside twigs. From these eggs come minute nymphs, which at once make their way into the ground. There they shed their shells and grow rapidly. Their food is juice sucked from roots. They make successive mud dwellings attached to these roots. The largest observed in the eastern United States were 18 inches below the surface. Each was a rough ball of earth about 2 inches long and 3 fourths of an inch wide. The ball is lined on the inside by smooth mud and contains only one nymph. Every time an individual molts and grows larger, it must make a new house. When they emerge from the last of their feeding chambers, the locusts dig rapidly upward and construct a somewhat different type of dwelling some inches below the surface. These are two-chambered, with upper and lower rooms connected by tunnels five to ten inches long. They are so ingeniously constructed, according to Dr. E. A. Andrews of Johns Hopkins University, that they provide, quote, the advantage of safety along with quick access to the surface when the proper time comes. In the shaft, the nymph climbs close to the surface or falls rapidly to the bottom to escape attacks. The lining of the shaft is smooth mud a few millimeters thick. The shafts are by no means always straight or of uniform diameter, but may be sinuous and present swollen regions." End quote. In one area examined, he found at the topsoil, was such a mass of small stones and roots that the insects must actually have cut their way through roots. Large obstacles often were avoided by a change in direction. Quote, the chief implements used in making cavities in the earth, end quote, according to Dr. Andrews' report, quote, are the big first legs. Here, as in other legs, the end segment is used chiefly in walking and may be folded down when not needed. The second segment from the tip is used to pick off particles of earth. The third segment is the largest and, like a powerful thumb, acts with the opposing second segment as a forceps to pick up pellets of earth and small stones. The minute particles picked loose from the earth are raked together by the tip segment to make a pellet, which the forceps can carry or shove into the walls of the cavity. However, all parts of the body may come into use, 
for the hind legs and the abdomen may help shove earth aside, and the head may carry earth plastered upon it. In vertical tunnels, the animal braces its legs against the sides, and, if disturbed, relaxes and drops down." End quote. The last dwelling is large enough for the nymphs to turn around inside and usually has a flattened floor. The top comes quite close to the surface without actually breaking through, leaving only a few millimeters of earth through which the insect must dig when the transmutation to an adult locust takes place. Examination of many of these tubular dwellings shows that there are no interconnections between them. Each has its own individual exit and along its course avoids contact with other chambers, although they often are very close together. This last home of the locust, before it emerges from the everlasting darkness to the world of light and quick death which is its preordained destiny, is not necessarily restricted to the earth, but may be contained above the surface. Aerial extensions may, in fact, be abundant, and are in the form of turrets, towers, cones, chimneys, huts, and adobe houses. The walls are of dense mud, not natural soil. Externally, they are made of tiny mud pellets, but lined internally with the same smooth layer found in the underground dwellings. End of section number 108. Section 109 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Plants that Create Mirages An explorer in the desolate heights of the Santa Marta Mountains in northeastern Colombia fog wrapped and ten thousand feet above sea level may see a flock of sheep grazing placidly among rocks ahead of him then looking the other way he may see an assembly of cowled robed priests apparently in the midst of some weird ecclesiastical ceremony but when he reaches the places where he thought he saw these things, there are neither sheep nor priests. He finds instead two strange varieties of the aster family, both among the real curiosities of the plant kingdom. The vegetable sheep are bushy plants which grow on nearly barren ground near the mountain tops. The individual plant consists of thickly branched stems about the size of a human finger, bearing many layers of leaves covered with wool-like hairs. Sometimes these leaves are so thick that the point of a pencil cannot be thrust through them. Some of the plants may be as large as a living room sofa. The extreme compactness of these plants in their dense covering of hairs is an adaptation to the hostile conditions under which they must live. The habitat consists of rocky slopes where the hot, dry winds of summer and the snows, low temperature, and violent gales of winter expose them to a perpetual alternation of desert and arctic conditions. In the same general region are the monk plants, belonging to a different family, who have responded in the same way to similar conditions. Seen from a distance on a mountainside, especially through a light fog, a patch of these plants looks decidedly like a congregation of several hundred priests. The vegetable sheep also are found in New Zealand, but there are no known intermediaries between the closely similar species growing on opposite sides of the earth. End of section 109 Section 110 of 
The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Octopus Worm. Evolution's Mystery. Worms that give birth to their own grandchildren. Animals that have no digestive, muscular, nervous, glandular, or excretory organs. Such paradoxical creatures are the dicemid mosasoans, teeny worms that live inside octopuses. These little worms are among the most curious living things in nature. It is quite uncertain whether they are a step upward in evolution from the single-celled protozoans, or, like some other worms, a degenerate form of the many-celled animals it might be maintained that they represent a distinct branch of the animal kingdom. The body of a dicemid consists of a single cell, almost half an inch long, in the form of a hollow tube, surrounded by a layer of small cells. The immediate offspring are formed, and in some cases live their entire lives and reproduce in turn inside one of these skin cells. The grandchildren break through the body of the grandparent at any place they choose, apparently without causing any wounds and live for a short time as free-swimming animals, until they find an octopus whose kidneys they can enter. Then the whole life cycle starts over again. Apparently the infestation in no way injures the octopus, and the worms are of no practical importance in the world. Each kind, octopus or squid, in coastal areas has its own particular species of these parasites, of which about 35 kinds are known. The worm's body contains no organs, tissues, or glands in the usual sense of the word. Before being born, the larvae attain their full complement of body cells, are able to swim about, and have within them the germ cells that will give rise to the next generation. Birth is very simple. The larvae just push out, or are squeezed out, through the sides or ends of their parent at almost any point. The parent continues to develop and bear more larvae in the same manner, the number developing at any one time in the cell may range from one, or two, or a hundred, or more. These larvae remain in the octopus as fully developed worms, but at certain times the germ cells develop into much smaller individuals, called infuse regions, hard to distinguish from large protozoa. These never leave the birth cell inside the parent, but produce germ cells of their own, which develop into free swimming creatures, known as infusory forms. These break away from the grandparent worm and from the octopus and become free swimming animals. They are microscopic, less than a three hundredth of an inch long. They live from three days to a week. Here may be the borderline between single celled and multi celled animals, or perhaps the greatest degeneration in animal life. End of section 110. Read by Caleb Stagiyama, Detroit, Michigan. Section 111 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry, the Monster Bear of Kamchatka. A giant black bear, probably the largest of flesh eating animals, lives in the dense, hardly explored pine forests of southern Kamchatka. This creature is still unknown to science. So far as known, it has never been seen by a white man. There is, however, considerable evidence for its existence, presented in a report made several years ago by Dr. Sten Bergman of the State Museum of Natural History at Stockholm, who spent two years on the Kamchatkan Peninsula. Photographs have been taken of this animal's footprint in the snow, it leaves a track 15 inches long and 10 inches wide. Dr. Bergman was shown a pelt of the giant bear. It was the largest bearskin he had ever seen. Deep black in color and covered with short hair, in striking contrast to the long hair of other Kamchatkan bears. He also saw a gigantic bear skull, the teeth of which indicate that it belonged to a young individual. Apparently, this Kamchatkan black bear exceeds the size of the Kodiak Island bear, 
which lives across Bering Strait and is the largest known flesh-eating mammal. The wilderness of the country and its dense vegetation have protected the giant bear from naturalists and hunters. The whole land is a veritable paradise for bears, who hide away in the dense thickets along the Kamchatkan rivers and subsist on the abundant salmon. They are so numerous that a native does not dare venture into the brush in summer without first shouting to let the bears know he is coming. They will keep out of a man's way if he is warned, but are likely to attack him if surprised. The great majority of Kamchatkan bears are relatively small animals compared to those of northern Europe. Some are black, but the majority are yellowish white or light brown. The giant animal may be an extreme variation of this race, or may represent an entirely different species. He is naturally the subject of much native legendary. Some stories have been interpreted as indicating that mammoths existed within the time of man in the northern wilderness of both hemispheres. But such a giant bear would fit the descriptions as well as would a small elephant-like creature. If it were not for the great numbers of smaller bears, man could scarcely subsist in this country. There are, for example, no roads through the desolate land between the villages, but all along the rivers and through the forests are well-marked paths made by the bears, who seem to have an engineering instinct in choosing the most logical places for crossing morasses and mountains. These paths are about the only means of human communication, and eventually, if the land is ever settled, will become the roads, in the same way elephant trails in Africa and India and bison trails in the United States became the hard-surfaced highways of today. Engineers hardly can improve on the instinct of the animals. The small bears also play an important role in the domestic economy of the few inhabitants. The thick, warm pelt is used as a bed. Out of the skin, the natives make reins, snowshoes, and dog traces. The meat is much appreciated. In remoter parts of the country, the linings of the intestines are used for window panes instead of glass. Many of the native medicines are derived from the bear. Both among the Kamchatkan natives and the Ainu of northern Japan, the animal is revered as a god, the concept being that the great celestial bear, out of his benevolence to man, provided creatures in his own form to furnish them food and clothing. End of section 111. Read by Caleb Stagiyama, Detroit, Michigan. Section 112 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Strange Denizens of the Deep. Most fearsome of all sharks in appearance is the Isistius brasiliensis, found in the tropical Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans. It is a wine-brown colored creature, with sharp teeth set in twenty rows, which glow at night with an unearthly light. When the specimen, taken at night, was removed into a dark apartment, it afforded a very extraordinary spectacle, relates naturalist F. D. Bennett. The entire inferior surface of the body and head emitted a vivid greenish phosphorescent gleam, imparting to the creature, by its own light, a truly ghastly and terrible appearance. The luminous effect was constant and not perceptibly increased by agitation or friction. When the shark expired, which was not until it had been out of the water more than three hours, the luminous appearance faded entirely from the abdomen and more gradually from other parts, lingering longest around the jaws and on the fins. The only part of the under surface of the animal which was free from the luminosity was the black collar around the throat. One of the sea's strangest denizens is the bramble shark. It is a shark of medium size, whose body is almost completely covered with short, sharp spines. This fantastic creature apparently is widely distributed through the Atlantic and Pacific, but it is not likely to come into the hands of collectors. Its general flabbiness stamps it as a deep-water animal, and the anomalous position of its fins indicates that it is a weak swimmer. 
its spiny armament obviously is designed for protection. Entirely harmless, it is probable, are the great basking sharks, which sometimes reach a length of forty feet. When encountered, they rarely, if ever, try to defend themselves, but attempt to escape by swimming slowly away. Stories that this monster dives when harpooned, and sometimes will drag a small boat with its crew to the bottom, now are discredited. Although it reigns as a monster among sharks, it is not actually as dangerous as the common dogfish shark. Perhaps the most dangerous are the so-called carcaeodons, found in most warm seas, though, though nowhere in abundance. They are among the most powerful and voracious of fishes, but still far less frightful than their fossil ancestors. The latter were the largest of all fishes. They were probably twice the length of the largest basking or whale sharks. Some were more than 88 feet long. End of section 112. Section 113 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Communism Among the Bees. Honeybees have achieved an ideal communistic state. All the 50,000 or more members of a family, or progeny of a single queen, share and share alike. A single sample of sugar or nectar brought into the hive by a forager is participated in by all the bees. Thus, all get essentially the same diet. They all acquire a common odour by which they can recognise each other. This odour constitutes a scent language, which is the basis of the extremely complex bee social life. These observations, based on experiments with radioactive sugar, are reported by Dr. Roland Ribbons of Cambridge University. In one of these experiments, Dr. Ribbons reports, A marked bee is trained to collect sugar solution from a small glass tube, and when radioactive sugar is substituted, the bee continues to collect the radioactive syrup quite happily. It returns to the hive, and what happens to the labelled sugar can be followed quite easily. Every bee that receives some can be spotted by means of a Geiger counter. By collecting a sample of bees from the hive, one can discover what proportion of the colony has acquired some of the sugar. One stomachful can be shared among almost all the bees of a large colony. The experiments indicate that this sharing is a random affair. The sugar is passed on irrespective of the recipient's age or occupation. Building up of a colony odour through universal sharing of the food supply enables members of the colony to recognise each other. This apparently makes little difference when food is abundant but becomes of great importance in periods of scarcity. At those times of the year, Dr. Rubens points out, when there are insufficient flowers to provide all the bees with food, they often try to steal the honey stored in other colonies. Then the ability to recognise hive mates and to distinguish them from other honeybees will enable a colony to defend itself against attempts at robbery. However, the honeybee community does not defend itself by attacking every invader that does not possess the community odour. Strangers are attacked only under certain circumstances. In order to investigate these circumstances, two colonies of differently coloured bees were placed close to each other, with the entrances only two inches apart, so that the bees often went into the wrong colony by mistake. When good supplies of nectar were available, the intruders were allowed to enter the strange colony, but when nectar was short, the strangers were attacked and thrown out, often being killed in the process. Production of a common and distinctive odour which enables a colony to defend itself against members of other communities is a very important consequence of the habit of food sharing. Better sharing means better defence, and so a greater likelihood that the community will be able to survive and perpetuate its kind. The habit plays a key role in the system of communication, which enables a new forager to learn about suitable crops, and that the new recruit always receives a sample of the crop the colony is working. The first flight becomes a search for a crop with a similar scent. The habit enables the worker bee in a colony to be apprised of this presence of their queen. A substance derived from her body is conveyed from bee to bee in the shared food, and in the event that any deficiency in the substance they take steps to rear another queen. In addition, it probably helps to ensure an effective division of labour in the colony, which has to be so integrated that a suitable proportion of the worker population carries out each of the various tasks necessary for the maintenance of the colony. End of section 113, Communism Among the Bees.
Section 114 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Winifred Asman. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Candles on Bushes. In parts of Colombia, candles, in the form of white, wax-like berries, grow on bushes. These berries produce oil of such excellent quality that it is used almost exclusively for altar lamps in Catholic churches throughout the country. The berries grow abundantly on a jungle plant with leaves like those of rhubarb. In only one part of the country is the plant cultivated. It is a crop of the semi-hostile Pez Indians. Harvesting is somewhat difficult because the oil containing white seed is inside a bird coat. This must be removed and the seeds placed in hot water. The oil rises to the surface where it can be skimmed off. When it is desired to make candles, a dozen or more berries are strung on a stick. Such a candle gives off a beautiful soft light. End of section 114。section 115 of the strangest things in the world。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。THE STRANGEST THINGS IN THE WORLD by Thomas Henry The Desert Rat Manufactures Water All animals require water in their bodies, but some can get it without actually drinking. The desert rat, which lives among the bare sand dunes of California's Death Valley, can get along indefinitely without water and with only dry barley seeds for food. In spite of this, about 65% of its body weight is water. Most of the water is actually made in the animal's body. The rat's digestive processes extract the hydrogen contained in the barley seeds and combine it with oxygen in the air to create water. End of section 115. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 28th of February, 2022. Section 116 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Cased System of the Termite The oldest civilization on earth is that of the termites. The superorganization which these blind white creatures of the dark have achieved precedes by thousands of millennia those of the ants and the bees. Termites have a far longer history on earth being considered modifications of the ancient cockroaches, who were among the first insects to leave any traces of their existence on land. Cockroaches swarmed in the club moss forests at least 250 million years ago. The termite order is at least 30 million years old. Some of its most primitive forms still are alive. In most of the approximately 2,000 species of termites which have been identified all over the world, there are five castes, apparently determined from birth, although not so rigidly as among ants. First are the winged males and females with large brains and eyes and hard dark shells. These depart in great swarms from the ancestral nest once or twice a year, usually in spring and fall. They are feeble flyers and depend chiefly on transportation by air currents. The majority are eaten by birds. The few surviving pairs from such a flight excavate cells in the earth or in wood and start new colonies. There is at least one king and one queen in each cell. Sometimes there are two or more pair. They remain partners for life. Both are imprisoned within the cell. Before entering it, they slough off their wings, which henceforth would be worthless. 
The termite queen becomes an inert egg-laying machine, sometimes the size of a small potato. In some species, she lays an average of 60 eggs a minute, or 80,000 a day. She may live as long as 10 years. Thus, each queen ideally produces about a half billion new individuals. Her bulk increases as much as 50-fold in adult life, about the most phenomenal growth in nature. The second termite cased, for which there is no parallel among the ants, consists of both males and females, with only rudiments of wings, less fully developed reproductive organs, and somewhat smaller eyes and brains. They presumably serve only as an auxiliary royalty, functioning in case the true rulers die. Apparently, by some subtle alchemy known only to termites, they can be transformed into fully functioning sexual individuals if an emergency arises. A third caste is made up of smaller insects with extremely minute eyes and brains and barely discernible reproductive organs. Below them come the entirely unpigmented, soft-bodied workers with still smaller eyes and brains, usually, in fact, with no eyes at all. These still are potentially males and females, in distinction to any society where all workers and soldiers are female. Lowest in the scale are the big-headed, blind soldiers, also of both sexes, with barely a trace of brain. Relative numbers in these cases differ from species to species. An analysis of an Australian termite colony accounted for 1,560,500 workers, 200,000 soldiers, and 44,000 potentially reproductive individuals. End of section 116, read by Sandra. Section 117 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or go to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Shark That Stands Upright. Monsters of Gulf of Mexico Waters is a shark which weighs from 10 to 12 tons and is from 30 to 50 feet long. Largest of its ancient family and an entirely inoffensive creature, this strange animal literally stands upright while feeding. On a recent trip, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service ship encountered several large schools of blackfin tuna. In the middle of each school was a large object which looked like a barrel. This object was the snout of a whale shark. The creature kept opening its enormous mouth two or three inches below the surface. From 50 to 100 gallons of water would flow into the mouth and be strained out through the gills. This water was full of larval crustaceans, or banded shrimps, about a half inch long. In each observed case, the body of the shark stood vertically. Why each shark should select a school of tuna and put itself almost precisely in the center of the swarming fish is a complete mystery. It does not eat tuna, except possibly very small ones. Presumably, however, it feeds on about the same sort of material as the fish. It knows there is food where the tuna congregate. The whale shark is among the most mysterious of the larger sea animals. It is a solitary creature, seldom seen. Its tiny teeth are only about one fifteenth of an inch long and it is supposedly entirely a feeder on plankton, the minute organisms which are bound in seawater. End of section 117. Section 118 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Dead Man's Vine. A semi-legendary plant in Colombia is the Ayahuasco, or Dead Man's Vine. From it, Indians make a brew which, it is claimed, is quite similar to the imaginary drug by which Dr. Jekyll split the good and evil elements of his character. When a medicine man first gulps the brew, this is an ethnological report which the botanist cannot confirm, he turns deadly pale, trembles in every limb, and the expression on his face is one of intense pain and horror. This is followed in about a minute by a reckless fury in which he seizes whatever lies at hand and starts beating the trees and ground. In about ten minutes the excitement leaves him, 
and he falls to the earth completely exhausted. There are not as yet any scientific accounts of the plant's influence. End of section 118. Section 119 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lore. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Insect with Fourteen Lives. A pinhead-sized, worm-like larvae of a louse may possess one's life, ultimate secrets, and elixir of controlled growth. The strange ways of life of a hormiphus, hamaleotid, which goes through fourteen different life stages in the course of a year's lifetime, are being studied by scientists in the hope of isolating a mysterious something which may open the door of some of the greatest paradoxes of biology. The insect is an aphis which causes galls, growths comparable to animal cancers on which hazel leaves. These growths result when the aphis injects into the leaf by means of a microscopic apparatus like a hypodermic needle, an infinitesimally minute amount of an unidentified substance. The gall grows around and over the insect. It becomes the tiny creature's home. The substance completely changes the nature of the plant cells. They normally would become leaf cells, highly specialized to fit into leaf growth. Now they become gall cells. Something similar happens in cancer, except that the new cell growth, having escaped from the government of the animal body, is entirely uncontrolled. The gall cells, however, still remain under some sort of control. They always form galls, and they do not kill the leaf, which is necessary for their existence. Marvelous is the life story of the aphis itself. The sequence starts with a stem mother, a newly hatched female. She injects the substance into the leaf, and the house builds itself around her. Inside this house, she passes through four stages. Her structure changes completely four times. That is, she becomes, in a sense, four different animals, one after another. In the fourth stage, she gives birth to from 50 to 100 living young. Each of these young, in turn, goes through four stages. In the last of these, they have wings. The winged insects crawl out through a hole in the bottom of the gall. Each produces from 10 to 20 young on the bottom of the leaf. Each of the young, in turn, goes through five stages. During the last, they are both males and females. This is the only time the male makes its appearance in the life cycle. All the other births are by parthogenesis. Each of the females lays eggs in the winter on the witch hazel. The buds are destined to become leaves in the early spring. The eggs hatch a few days before the leaves appear. Each of the newly hatched aphids, all females, injects some of the house-building material into the leaf upon which she finds herself. She becomes a new stem mother, and the strange process starts all over again. The rapid reproduction rate might well be overwhelming to the witch hazels and consequently suicidal for the insects except for certain enemies which keep down the numbers of the lice. Such tiny forms of life as larval lace wings are able to crawl through the hole in the bottom of the gall and feed on the occupants during their various stages. University of Virginia biologists who have been giving particular attention to the aphis, are interested primarily in the substance injected into the leaves. It must be one of the most potent growth factors in nature. The amount any one aphid is able to inject is indescribably minute, even though some of them make as many as 50 separate injections. The material causes the leaf cells to become larger and to multiply much more rapidly until a house 
many times the size of the aphis is complete in a few days. The structure is perfect, even including a picket fence of tiny hairs around its base to keep out invaders. The substance exists in such minute amounts that, thus far, it has been impossible to isolate it in anything approaching a pure form. The Virginia biologists have set themselves a task requiring infinite patience over many years, tracing the increase of the amount in salivary glands of each individual through each of its 14 lives, and also through the eggs with which the strange life cycle starts. The present clues indicate that the substance is a filterable virus, tiniest of living things compared with which the pinhead size aphis is like a whale compared to a fly. End of section 119. Section 120 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Shyness Characteristic of Giant Rats Biggest of the extant true rats is the giant rat of Liberia, it is two feet or more in length and is similar in appearance to the Norway rat which infests houses all over the world. Fortunately, this creature never has invaded the homes of men. It is a shy animal of the cane brakes. End of section 120 Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 28th of February, 2022. Section 121 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Nocturnal Potto One of the weirdest of living mammals is the Potto, ghost monkey of West African jungles. It is about the size of a squirrel, with soft yellow fur and protruding yellow eyes which shine like malevolent witch lights in the darkness of the jungle nights. The potto is a nocturnal animal of the treetops. Its weird, whimpering cries are believed by natives to be the voices of evil spirits. The little creature is an aberrant member of the family of lemurs, ancient offshoots of the same family from which sprang the monkeys and great apes. End of section 121 Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 3rd of March, 2022. Section 122 of the Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Where Trees Are Square. A few miles north of the Panama Canal Zone is the Valley of Square Trees. This is the only known place in the world where trees have rectangular trunks. They are members of the Cottonwood family. Saplings of these trees are being grown at the University of Florida to find out if they retain their squareness in a different environment. It is believed 
however, that the shape is probably due to some unknown but purely local condition. That the cause is deep-seated is indicated by the fact that the tree rings, each representing a year's growth, also are square. End of section 122. Section 123 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cheryl Holmes, M.D. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Lamp That is a Beetle The most brilliant animal luminescence known is that of the carbuncle beetles of Puerto Rico. They emit a light so brilliant that one or two inside an inverted tumbler illuminate a room of moderate size so that one can read a newspaper at night. Fields are illuminated brilliantly every night by these beetles flying about a foot above the ground. The light is not intermittent and seems nearly continuous. It varies from yellow to green for different species. Occasionally it is yellowish red. End of section 123. Section 124 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cheryl Holmes, M.D. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Rainstorms of Worms. Rains of worms often have been reported. After a summer shower, surfaces of puddles sometimes will be found covered with countless threadworms or nematodes. These worms have just come out of the bodies of water beetles and other insects, where they have developed as parasites. Before the shower, the insects were dormant. These little worms in farm watering troughs led to the long-held belief that horsehairs sometimes changed into worms. This does not, however, explain the following report in the Levant Times, an English newspaper published in Constantinople of August 6, 1872. A letter from Bucharest reports a curious atmospheric phenomenon which happened there on the 25th ult, a quarter past nine in the evening. During the day, the heat had been stifling and the sky was cloudless. In the evening, everybody went out walking and the gardens were crowded. The ladies were mostly dressed in white, low-necked robes. Toward nine o'clock, a small cloud appeared on the horizon, and a quarter of an hour afterwards, rain began to fall, which, to the horror of everybody, was found to consist of black worms the size of ordinary flies. All the streets of Bucharest were strewn with these curious animals. End of section 124 Section 125 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Icy Arctic Wonderland. Abundant and fantastic are the creatures of the shallow Arctic sea bottom. All are invertebrates worms, sea anemones, and a host of other creatures, most of whom spend their lives buried in the mud. Some of the creatures and their curious ways of life, ribbon worms which, when washed ashore, literally tie themselves in knots, curl up in balls, and secrete bags of mucus around themselves, bright green spoon worms about three inches long, these formerly were eaten by Eskimos, billions of small transparent and essentially invisible arrow worms, one species about a half an inch long, apparently is the kangaroo of the worm world. An important element of the bottom fauna at Point Barrow, Alaska, are the lace worms. Hardly a stone in the area does not have at least one lace or moss patch. There is a delicately peach-colored sea anemone, a bottom-dwelling animal remotely related to the coral polyps, which display an amazing phenomenon, according to a Smithsonian report by Dr. G. E. McGinty. Quote, 
when it was subjected to unfavorable conditions, such as overcrowding in a pan of water, he says, it cast out through the mouth a translucent white inner lining with transparent stubby tentacles. These tentacles were tiny anemones. If conditions remained adverse, more offspring were cast off, each lot smaller than its predecessor. End quote. That is, when in trouble the animal spits out babies, presumably an emergency measure for preservation of the species and a way of reproduction not hitherto recorded. Apparently the same phenomenon occurs in the sea. Partly grown specimens of these offspring, dredged from the bottom, at first were mistaken for new species. Some of these sea anemones are quite colorful, one purplish-red, one lavender, one lemon-yellow, and one with translucent peach-colored tentacles. Numerically, the most abundant animals of the Arctic are the amphipod fleas, which form an important food source for fish and seals. Great numbers live on the undersides of ice cakes, from which the bearded seal sweeps them with its whiskers. End of section 125, read by Sandra near Montreal. Section 126 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Fish that live on land. Siam and Burma are the lands of queer fish. Climbing fish, stone-eating fish, hunting fish, dry land fish, singing fish, and archer fish. In the distant geological past, life on this planet was confined to the seas. Eventually, some creature, belonging to the common ancestry of terrestrial animals and fish, emerged from the water and over a period of countless generations established itself on land. Something of the same general sort of development may be taking place in Siamese lakes and rivers today, with a new kind of land animal in the process of evolution. Currently, two or three species of fish are learning to live out of water for considerable periods. At least one of them appears to have reached the stage where it must breathe air to survive. These evolving dry land fish were studied intensively by the late Dr. Hugh M. Smith, fisheries advisor to the Siamese government for 12 years. One is a species somewhat like a perch in general appearance. It belongs to a group which has an accessory respiratory organ, perhaps the beginning of a lung, situated in a cavity above the gills, by which oxygen may be taken directly from the atmosphere. The gills themselves appear inadequate to sustain life. The fish probably would drown, although the process would be very slow if kept too long under water. A common method of fishing in Siam is with a spade. Some fish spend as much as four months of each year buried in damp soil. Local fishermen dig two or three feet deep in the marshes for them. End of section 126 Read by Winifred Asman, North Vancouver, Canada, on Wednesday, March 9, 2022. Section 127 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Special Language of Bees. The study of bee language now has advanced to differentiation of bee dialects. Some years ago, Dr. Carl von Frisch of the University of Munich established the fact that bees actually possessed a means by which they could communicate with each other and without which the remarkable organization within the swarm would have been nearly inexplicable. Their language consists primarily of signs, like that of deaf and dumb persons. Dr. von Frisch reached the point where he could get some idea of what the bees were talking about, and even 
predict their behavior from their conversation. Recently, Dr. Von Frisch has found that different varieties have quite different languages, perhaps as far apart as French and German. One variety cannot tell what another is discussing. He has gone one step further to the discovery that the insects probably talk also in sounds that are inaudible to the human ear. The audible buzzing is not a means of communication. There are indications, he says, in a report to the Rockefeller Foundation, that sounds, probably in the supersonic range, play a role in their communications. Physiologically, it would be interesting to know how they judge distance. Their dances indicate with remarkable exactness the distance between the hive and the feeding place. How do they adjust themselves to the changing positions of the sun when they use it as a compass? Apparently, they have an excellent memory for time, for they seem to know that the sun at a certain time will occupy a certain place in the heavens. Dr. von Frisch and his colleagues at the University of Munich are also making an intensive study of the insect eye and the physiology of the insect sense of smell. Previous research has shown that worker bees have a special scent gland under voluntary control. Only when a good source of nectar is found is the fragrance, evidently quite powerful and attractive to other bees, released. Then it permeates the immediate neighborhood. It is the bee language equivalent for the word here. When a cruising worker gets a whiff of this odor, it knows there is a plentiful supply of nectar close at hand and starts a search for it. Bees cannot distinguish red from black, Dr. Frisch has found. This probably is the reason so few red-blossoming plants depend on these insects for distributing their pollen. Nearly all red-blossoming species depend on birds and butterflies, both of which are acutely sensitive to red. One notable exception, however, is the European poppy, whose brilliant red blossoms carpet the landscape in late spring. The German experimenter has found that these blossoms are not red to the bee. They possess a color which cannot be described because it cannot be experienced by the human eye. The poppy blossoms reflect a great deal of the ultraviolet light in the sunshine, and to this the bee eye is extremely sensitive. The color must be quite different from any of the shades at the blue end of the spectrum which are visible to man. To the bee, it is probably somewhat like violet. Even the more or less degenerate human nose can be trained to discriminate some of the bee odors that apparently have so much meaning in the life of the hive. After practicing for a few months, Dr. N. E. McIndoo, of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, was able to recognize the three castes, queens, drones, and workers, merely by smelling them. With more practice, he was able to make even finer discriminations, as he reports. The younger the workers, the less pronounced is the odor emitted. To the human nose, the odor from nurse bees and wax generators is much less pronounced than is that from old workers. Workers just emerged from the cells have a faint Swedish odor, but lack the characteristic bee odor, and workers removed from the cells just before they begin cutting their way out emit a still fainter Swedish odor. Old queens have a strong Swedish odor, while that of queens just emerged from cells is much pronounced, as is the bee odor of the workers. The majority of old drones have a faint odor, while every young drone has a stronger one. It is slightly different from that of young workers, and is less Swedish. All the offspring of the same queen seem to inherit a peculiar odor from her, which becomes the family odor. Apparently, each worker emits an individual odor, which is different from that of any other worker. Of all odors, that of the hive is most important. It seems to be the most 
fundamental factor upon which the social life of the colony depends, and upon which the social habit, perhaps, was acquired. Taste discrimination is roughly parallel to that of humans. The bee certainly can distinguish the primary tastes, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. It naturally is keenly sensitive to different degrees of sweetness, yet some sugars, which are extremely sweet to man, are tasteless to the insects. The same is true of such sweeteners as saccharin. The bee's sense of smell also runs parallel to that of man both in the ability to discriminate fine difference in odors and in the thresholds of sensitivity. This appears to be a very important factor in the location of nectar-bearing flowers. However, the bee appears unable to detect an odor from any great distance. It is probably due to the sense of smell that scout bees are able to locate good feeding grounds. After marking them with their own peculiar secreted odor, they return immediately to the hive to tell the others about them. The dance of a return scout varies in intensity according to the richness of the find, and the workers who witness it become correspondingly excited. If the scout executes only a feeble dance, there is only a small exodus from the hive. End of section 127. Section 128 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Poisonous Platters of the Sea One of the most dreaded of all sea creatures is the venomous stingray, of which there are several hundred species, distributed over the world, mostly in tropical waters. On the upper side of the tail is a sawtooth bone dagger from two to fifteen inches long, which can be driven through a man's leg. The teeth extrude a venom quite similar to that of the rattlesnake. Largest is the giant stingray of Australian waters. A full-grown specimen weighs about 800 pounds. The fearsome and gruesome bat stingray of the California coast weighs up to 200 pounds and is quite abundant. All the rays are bottom-dwelling animals, leading sedentary lives on flat, sandy ground. All are carnivorous, devouring smaller fish and mollusks. Fortunately, they are not very aggressive and will flee from man if given warning. Still, lifeguard stations along the California beaches reported nearly 400 injuries from the creatures in the summer of 1952. End of section 128. Section 129 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Our Un-American Food A half-dozen vanished civilizations make their contributions to the American Thanksgiving dinner. Onions from ancient Egypt. Peas from Ethiopia. Parsnips and turnips from ancient China. Aztec Maya and the skin-wrapped Cro-Magnon all did their part in the darkness of prehistory to make possible the plates which are loaded so lavishly. They did better than they knew. Very few new vegetables have been introduced in historic times. In many cases, little improvement has been made on the products of the ancients. The story of potatoes alone contains enough romance and adventure for a good-sized novel. Its origin is unknown, but its wanderings from America to Europe and back to America again constitute a fascinating story. Cultivated lettuce never has been found wild. It is believed to have been derived from India or Central Asia. It is one of the oldest known vegetables. Herodotus, Hippocrates, and Aristotle mention it in references to Greek gardens. Chaucer notes its cultivation in England in 1340. Sixteen varieties are listed as being grown in American gardens as early as 1806. 
celery is a biennial plant native to the marshlands of southern europe north africa and southwestern asia it long was considered poisonous and was not used as food until modern times the israelites complained to moses in the wilderness because they couldn't have onions to which they had become accustomed during the captivity in egypt the cultivated onion probably originated in afghanistan pumpkins and squashes were grown in america long before white men came on the scene evidence of both have been found among ruins of settlements of the basket makers about the earliest agricultural people on this continent they probably came from mexico the hubbard squash came to light in marblehead massachusetts in eighteen fifty five it had been growing there for more than fifty years peas are the oldest known vegetables they are believed to have originated in ethiopia but to have spread over europe and asia long before the dawn of history they were eaten perhaps even cultivated after a fashion by men of europe's stone age columbus planted some in the west indies in fourteen ninety three they spread rapidly among the indians and became one of the chief crops of the iroquois the species from which cabbage is derived grows wild in north africa and along the european shore of the mediterranean it has been cultivated for four thousand years greeks and romans grew it in their gardens most of the american varieties however originated in north europe the turnip is a native of central and western china seed probably was brought to america by some of the earliest european settlers the radish is a native of china and india it was cultivated by the greeks and the egyptians the parsnip is another asiatic root crop it first was planted in virginia in sixteen ninety only recently has it gotten away from the home garden to become a commercial crop popcorn is peculiarly american in early spanish writings reference is made to a ritual of the aztecs in which one hour before dawn there sallied forth all these maidens crowned with garlands of maize toasted and popped the grains of which were like orange blossoms and on their necks thick festoons of the same which passed under the left arm in the section one hundred twenty nine section one hundred and thirty of the strangest things in the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the strangest things in the world by thomas henry worms that commit mass suicide an entire generation of worms commits suicide every year every individual casts off its own head these worms are a himalayan variety of naids freshwater animals vaguely related to earth worms they are reddish brown and seldom more than an inch long the majority of the worms live with their heads buried in the mud tail ends waving freely in the air upon any alarm their bodies contract leaving no signs of life early in the spring these worms literally lose their heads and die compared with those of most worms their regenerative powers are quite feeble it is believed that the decapitation is due to the fact that egg-laying is accompanied by such violent contractions of the body that the front segments are disconnected every few years there is a report from somewhere in the united states or europe of enormous numbers of dead earthworms covering the ground a correspondent of the british scientific journal nature reported in nineteen twenty one about the middle of march i saw millions of dead worms morning after morning on pavements roads and paths they were great and small young and old of every known species and genus they lay prone and even when they were able to reach a grass plot alive they lacked the power to burrow the phenomenon is unexplained examination of the dead worms shows no unusual parasite 
or evidence of disease. End of section 130. Section 131 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Fish that survive freezing. There's a realm of supercooled life. Its denizens are deep-water fish that live long and happily in temperatures below the freezing point of their blood. But whenever one of them comes in contact with even a single crystal of ice, it freezes almost instantly. This strange phenomenon of marine life has been observed by biologists of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. These particular fish live at the bottom of Hebron Fjord in northern Labrador. The temperature there is about 1.7 below zero centigrade. Some have been caught, brought to the surface, and then plunged into a bath of seawater cooled to exactly the same temperature. They survived for several hours. When, however, one of them came in contact with an ice crystal, it froze stiff in a few seconds. The explanation, it appears, is that these fish normally live below the depth at which it is possible for ice crystals to form in water. Very careful experiments have shown that water can be carried far below its normal freezing point if it is kept entirely motionless and is absolutely free from minute particles of any sort which are necessary for the formation of ice crystals. This is about the condition that exists at the fjord bottom. Eventually, if the temperature is taken lower and lower, such water will solidify, but into a form far different from ice. It is non-crystalline, and can best be compared with glass. But even if this happened in the Hebron Fjord, it would not necessarily bother the fish. Their blood presumably would turn to glass. There would be no breaking of body cells such as results from the swelling of ice crystals. After an indefinite period, the animals might be brought out of the solid state, if the thawing could be accomplished quickly enough, none the worse for their experience. This has been accomplished with very minute organisms, but any techniques which might be used with higher plants or animals have not yet been discovered. The extent of life in the supercooled world is unknown. It hardly can be confined to fish. All sorts of mollusks, echinoderms, and worms are also bottom dwellers in Arctic and Antarctic waters. It's not cold, but ice that kills. End of section 131. Section 132 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Plants that Kill. The lethal dose Socrates was condemned to swallow by the stuffed shirtism of ancient Athens was D-propyl pipridine. This is the deadly alkaloid in the spotted hemlock, a common European weed which now grows extensively over most of the eastern United States. A closely related European species is the cowbane, which cows instinctively will not nibble. The devastating illness which fell upon 10,000 Greeks of the Anabasis Xenophon would have been interested to know, was caused by andromedotoxin. This is a resinous substance common to plants of the heath family the world over. It is the poisonous constituent of rhododendron, mountain laurel, and some kinds of azalgias. Honey from the blossoms of plants containing it is extremely poisonous. When pioneers first pushed their way over the Appalachians, their settlements were ravaged by epidemics of a fatal disease milk sickness. Farms and villages were abandoned as terror-stricken settlers fled from the scourge. It was due to tremetol, a complex chemical which has been found in several plants, chiefly white snake root, 
which causes the disease east of the Mississippi. When cows eat the snake root, the poison passes into the milk. By far, the most virulent plant growing in the United States is very little known, although it has caused many fatalities. This is the water hemlock, or secula, very different from the spotted hemlock, whose extract was forced upon Socrates. It grows in low, swampy places nearly everywhere. When the ground is soft in the spring, its roots can be pulled easily from the soil and have a pleasant odor that attracts children. It causes heavy losses of livestock. Next in virulence of all American plants is the world milkweed, which contains a closely allied resinous material not yet satisfactorily analyzed. It has caused the death of countless cattle. End of section 132. Section 133 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Caterpillars that pretend to be snakes. There are worm snakes, snake worms, and worm-like animals that instinctively imitate snakes. This is especially true of certain South American caterpillars, defenseless creatures whose only security is in mimicry. A large green tree-living caterpillar in British Guiana ordinarily remains motionless and looks like part of a vine stem. But when the branch is shaken, it rears the front part of its body and stretches horizontally. At the same time, it gives a twist, expanding its front segment into a bulbous enlargement with a big, menacing black eye spot, surrounded by a yellow ring. This it remains for a few minutes, looking very much like a poisonous tree snake that lives among green leaves. Serpent caterpillars abound in Brazil. The best example is Leucerhampha triptolemus, a creature that hangs vertically from stems of plants. When disturbed, it twists and shows a front extremely resembling the head and back of a snake. The curve of the caterpillar is just like that of a serpent. It keeps up a swaying, side-to-side -side movement for several seconds. The whole effect is to change what seems an innocent plant stem suddenly into an open-mouthed snake with red jaws and ferocious eyes. End of section 133. Section 134 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. All plants are luminous. All green foliage gives off an invisible, deep red, almost black light. This phenomenon is one of the most fundamental processes of life. It is associated closely with the photosynthesis upon which depends all life on Earth. This important discovery was made recently by biologists at the Oak Ridge Laboratory of the Atomic Energy Commission, while studying changes in a chemical known as adenosine triphosphate in plants engaged in photosynthesis. The formation of starches and sugars out of hydrogen from the soil and carbon from the atmosphere in the presence of light. Newly acquired knowledge about the process is paving the way to improved agricultural methods. The biologists used extracts from the bodies of fireflies, which give off a bright light when this chemical, an important source of energy in muscle, is present. Then they found that chloroplasts, the parts of plants most closely associated with the photosynthetic process, also would give off light when mixed with firefly juice and illuminated. They then made an unexpected discovery, that living extracts of green plants give off a light of their own without any mixing. The light given off by the chloroplasts now is believed to be the exact opposite of the first chemical step in photosynthesis. Light absorbed by the chloroplasts forms unstable chemical bonds within the plant, a small fraction of these chemically induced compounds recombine. The energy liberated by this process is trapped by the chlorophyll molecule, which in turn 
gives off the mysterious light. It has been established that leaves, if frozen while exposed to illumination, retain their light-producing ability for several months. It also has been found that certain extracts prepared from leaves undergoing exposure to light contain substances which give off a bright light when certain chemicals are added to them. End of section 134. Section 135 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Worms That Live in the Snow There are jet black worms that live in red snow. They come out of their snow burrows only during the late summer evening, crawl sluggishly on the surface, and disappear at sunrise the next morning. They have been observed swimming in shallow pools that form on the surface of the great Malaspina Glacier which flows down the slope of Mount St. Elias in Alaska. Presumably during the long subarctic winter, these worms burrow deep in the snow and remain in a torpid state. They subsist chiefly on the microscopic red algae which give the glacial snowfields a reddish tinge. The black worms themselves are innumerable. They have been photographed covering a trail a quarter mile long at an elevation of 5,200 feet in Oregon. They are enchytrades, relatives of earthworms. The common white variety now is raised commercially in vast numbers on diets of oatmeal and sour milk as food for fancy varieties of aquarium fish. Both worms and insects that normally live in snowfields are black. An investigator of the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory once found a multitude of white enchytrades in cakes of ice cut from a Massachusetts pond the previous winter. They were active when the ice thawed, but all died in a few days. The same investigator kept 30 specimens of another species in a tumbler of water, placed on a ledge outside his laboratory window. On a cold night, the water froze solid with the worms in a tangled mass in the center of the ice cake. All but three or four were alive, and appeared normal when the ice was thawed. About 75 years ago, housewives of Salina, Kansas, complained that the ice delivered from door to door was wormy. Cakes were found honeycombed with tiny white worms, probably enchytrades. They swam about actively when the ice thawed and infested food stored in refrigerators. All died when the temperature reached about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Whether any worm, except possibly the most minute, can survive complete freezing is doubtful. They live in little holes that form naturally when water freezes, and that are kept open by heat generated by the bodies of the creatures themselves. End of section 135. Section 136 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Strange Ways of Snails. Among Earth's deadliest creatures are cone snails, which inject into their victims a poison as virulent as that of the rattlesnakes. These snail-like animals have a poison-secreting gland in the head, and the venom is injected through the skin of the victim by tiny, needle-sharp, harpoon-shaped teeth. It is deadly not only to many kinds of sea animals, but also to man. The poison, acting on the nervous system, may in some cases kill in several hours. Fortunately, cone shells are timid, retiring, slow-moving creatures. They are among the loveliest of all seashells. Most valuable is the Glory of the Seas cone, which is worth several hundred dollars. Of the twenty known specimens in the world, only three are in American collections. Of the three hundred or more known varieties, only five or six from the Indo-Pacific area are definitely known to be venomous. The emperor's top shell is among the earth's most exquisite and, until recently, the rarest of seashells. This shell, about five inches in diameter, 
belongs to a sea snail of a genus fairly abundant during the Mesozoic geological period about 300 million years ago, and supposedly extinct until about eight years ago, when one was found alive in a Japanese lobster trap. Thereafter, the snail was seen very rarely until the present emperor of Japan ordered that all specimens be preserved for his private collection. Fortunately, his interest encouraged Japanese fishermen to keep a special lookout for the creatures, and since then they have been found quite frequently. They apparently are distributed around the world in semi-tropical waters. Two species have been located in the West Indies, and a new one recently has been reported in South Africa. The shells are rich golden orange in color, highlighted with reds and salmons. In the Smithsonian collections are specimens of the original shell collector, the snail that collects shells. This sea snail, widely distributed in tropical waters, has the habit of gluing to its own shell fragments of the shells of other animals, bits of coral, and almost every kind of debris it can pick up. The purpose is not known, but it may be for protective camouflage. Seen in shallow water, the creature looks like a little pile of broken shells on the sea bottom. There is a worm snail that builds great limestone causeways and bridges. This is the shelled sea snail of the Mediterranean, Termitis, worm-like. When the creature is young, its shell is a regular spiral which the owner, free to move about, carries on its back and into which it can retreat when alarmed. As the snail ages, the shell becomes twisted and contorted, like a tube, and is attached to an offshore rock. The animal crawls inside and soon dies. There are inestimably great numbers of these gastropods. They fix their shell tombs close together. These coil around each other to form solid masses of rock. Quatrophages describe them in these words. In Sicily, where calcareous rocks projected into the sea, I found they were surrounded by a kind of causeway, which, without varying much in width, which followed all the sinuosities of the shore almost exactly on a level with the surface of the water, filling up narrow chasms in some places and forming solid archways in others. Thus it afforded a smooth and easy path to one who did not object to having his legs washed by the waves. One might suppose the white and compact cement had been consolidated by man. The love life of some snails is confusing to Freudians. Each animal is provided with a quiver full of arrows, located in the right side of the neck. These darts can be discharged with considerable force. They are straight or curved shafts of carbonate of lime, which taper to exceedingly fine points. During the breeding season, the little mollusks meet in pairs. A couple will station themselves about an inch apart and start shooting at each other. Several darts are exchanged and each finds its mark. After this love duel, the two embrace. And, since each is both male and female, both lay eggs. The darts presumably were first developed as defense weapons, and, outmoded for service of Mars millions of generations ago, now have been turned to the service of Eros. Showers of snails have been reported intermittently. One of the most notable took place back in 1892 at the German town of Paderborn. Late in August, a great yellow cloud was seen over the town. In a few minutes, it burst into a torrential rain. Afterwards, the pavements were covered with water snails, all with shells broken after their long fall from the sky. Some snails can bore holes in solid rock. One, found chiefly on the French Channel coast near Boulogne, has bored holes six inches deep and an inch in diameter with a cup-shaped cavity at the bottom. The cavity is used for the animal's hibernation. A few snails are natural barometers. They reputedly are extremely sensitive to changes in humidity. One, generally gray, turns yellow just before a rain, and blue afterwards. Snails admittedly are very tenacious of life, and can endure extremes of heat, cold, and desiccation. Many instances have been cited, some nearly incredible. In 1846, for example, a desert snail from Egypt was fixed to a paper tablet in the British Museum in London. Four years later, it was observed that he had discolored the paper in his attempt to get away. Finding escape impossible, he had again retired. This led to his immersion in tepid water. The creature again came to life. 
he was alive and flourishing a week later. There are snail harpists and even singing snails. The former were described by Reverend H. G. Barnacle, British missionary naturalist, in a scholarly paper written in 1848. When up in the mountains of Oahu, I heard the grandest but wildest music, as from hundreds of Aeolian harps wafted to me on the breeze, and a native told me it came from singing shells. It was sublime. I could not believe it, but a tree close at hand proved it. Upon it were thousands of the snails. The animals drew after them their shells, which grated against the wood, and so caused the sounds. The multitude of sounds produced the fanciful music. The singing snails in Ceylon's blackish Lake Barikaloa were described by the British naturalist Sir Emerson Tennant. Sounds came up from the water like gentle thrills of a music chord, or like the faint vibrations of a wine glass when the rim is rubbed by a moistened finger. It was not one sustained note, but a multitude of tiny sounds, each clear and distinct in itself. On applying the ear to the woodwork of the boat, the vibrations greatly increased in volume. The natives said they were made by singing snails. End of section 136、section All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Vision Producing Plants. Among the plants used by California Indians for food, medicine, and magic is wild tobacco. It is smoked in a hollow elder stick, about eight inches long, from which the pith has been removed. A few inhalations of the smoke early in the morning are enough to overcome the smoker so that he is unable to stand on his feet. He inhales until extreme dizziness is achieved, and then he touches tobacco no more for the rest of the day. Indians can give no good reason for this concentrated form of smoking. It is simply the way of their ancestors. A mixture of plants, the honey of bumblebees, And the red scum off an iron spring constitute a popular love charm. The mixture is placed in a buckskin bag and carried under the arm. When the favor of some particular maiden is desired, it is necessary only to secure something associated with her and add it to the charm. The easiest to get is a pinch of soil upon which the lady has spat. This is used not only by lovers, but also by husbands wishing to secure the return of errant wives. Almost equally as important as tobacco in the life of these California Indians is a vision producing plant closely related to the common garden trumpet flower and to the deadly nightshade. The leaves from the east side of the plant are smoked. This brings about a state of exaltation in which various animals are seen to come and offer their help to the dreamer. Leaves from the west side are never smoked. It would mean certain death. The Indians associate the west with death. Much the same effect is obtained by drinking a blue, frothy decoction of the root. It not only produces visions, but acts as a powerful anesthetic. It is highly poisonous, however, and only those Indians who know the proper dosage make use of it. The plant is known as grandmother because of its comfort bringing qualities. End of section 137. Section 138 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Abominable Snowman. Mysterious beast of the high Himalayas is the abominable snowman, so called by natives. It is evidently a four footed, five toed mammal that weighs from a hundred and fifty to two hundred pounds and lives in family groups. 
this much at least can be deduced from its tracks in the snow, according to Dr. Edouard Weiss Dunant, leader of the Swiss Mount Everest expedition of 1952. He found the footprints in a snow-covered frozen lake at an altitude of about 15,000 feet. Although the tracks are bear-like, the animal apparently has a quite unbearish ability to leap from crag to crag in migrations from one high valley to another. The snow prints were first reported by Himalayan explorers to be ape-like, or even almost human, and this led to speculations that some still unknown type of big ape might have evolved in the high mountains. The tracks, says Dr. Weiss Dunant in his recent report to the Royal Geographic Society, are undoubtedly those of a large plantigrade animal, that is, one that walks on the sole of the foot with the heel touching the ground. This is the way of both bear and man. The sole of the foot is from four to five inches long by the depth of the tracks compared to those made by men of known weights. Some smaller footprints were found believed to be those of young animals. Three of the tracks showed imprints of claws. Small triangular markings on the heels of two of them were attributed to tufts of hair that grows on the bottom of the feet. Tracks of one animal were followed until they came to a rock several feet high over which it was necessary for the creature to jump. On the other side, imprints of three feet were found close together. Apparently, the animal had landed on these three feet. The tracks of the fourth foot were some distance ahead, indicating preparations for another jump. Beyond, Dr. Weiss Dunant picked up other trails. Three were coming out of a deep valley. The fourth came off the side of a glacier. These paths joined and thenceforward continued as a single set of tracks. The animals apparently step in each other's footprints while they proceed in single file. This is a customary procedure for mountaineers crossing a glacier where there is danger of falling into crevasses. Nepal Mountaineers have been familiar with the mysterious tracks for years, but nobody has been found who claims to have seen the animal. They call it a yeti. I could find no trace of meals nor of excrement, the Swiss explorer declared. This confirms my opinion that the animal only passes through and does not frequent these heights. We should at least have found a place of refuge, if not a lair, if the Yeti was living and hunting in the neighborhood. I rather think it passes between adjacent peaks only when, having scoured one valley, it tries to reach another. This animal is a wanderer, avoiding zones inhabited by man. It probably is not a carnivore, since there is very little other animal life, even in the high valleys, upon which it could feed. It obviously is an animal of quite superior intelligence to subsist at such high altitudes and to have kept itself hidden from humans for so long. End of section 138「Section 139 of the Strangest Things in the World」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Fish That Sing in the Moonlight There may be a fish that actually sings. 
that is, utters melodious sounds with a perceptible rhythm or beat which can be recorded in simple musical notation. This singing fish, which nobody actually has been able to identify, is one of the curiosities invariably called to the attention of visitors in the Batacaloa province of eastern Ceylon. It frequents only one deep lagoon and can be heard when the water is calm. Moonlight seems to draw the organism closer to the surface. On dark, calm nights, the music still can be heard, but it seems to be coming from greater depths. The singing sound, at least, is a verifiable fact, according to the Reverend J. W. Lang, a Jesuit priest in Batacaloa who has tried for several years to determine what sort of an organism is responsible. It is certain, he contends, that the sounds are made by something under the water. They are heard best when the head is held under the surface. By lowering a hydrophone attached to an amplifier into the lagoon, he was able to record the sounds. From this record, a friend familiar with musical notation was able to put them on paper. It has been established that several species of fish in the lagoon make distinctive sounds. One, a large black fish with a yellow belly and four whiskers on each side of its face, expresses sounds like a baby's fretful crying. A large chocolate-colored fish found among the bottom rocks makes a sound like the distant echo of a large firecracker. There is a curious little scaleless fish found in schools of 100 or more. As the school moves through the water, it produces a chorus of tinkling sounds. A phosphorescent light comes from inside the throats of these animals. Among all his catches, Father Lang has found nothing which can be identified with the singing fish but he is convinced the music comes from a living organism. That fish can and do make sounds now is well known. This was demonstrated conclusively by U.S. Navy investigators during the late war. They determined the characteristic sounds made by a large variety of sea creatures whose chatter was interfering with underwater sonic devices. End of section 139 Read by Andrea Kotzer. Section 140 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Brazil's Vicious Glowworm One of the most unusual of all luminous creatures is an insect larva found by farmers plowing damp soil in Brazil and Uruguay. It is a reddish-brown little worm with rows of green lights on both sides and a vivid red lamp on the front of its head. The red light is actually red, not white light, shining through a reddish skin. Adult females of the species retain the same luminous pattern. Male adults have only feeble yellow lights. The larvae are extremely vicious little creatures, predators on white grubs which infest the soil. End of section 140. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 4th of March, 2022. Section 141 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Margaret Lang. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Grasshoppers like chameleons. There is a jet black grasshopper that turns sky blue at sunrise. The curious creature is found on the summit of Mount Kosciuszko, highest peak in Australia where snow lingers into late summer, and nights are bitter cold. 
and the insect is of peculiar interest because of a temperature control mechanism otherwise unknown in nature. Several animals, notably chameleons and some fish, can change color, usually to match their environment. The changes are brought about by certain hormones released by stimulation of the eyes, which activate different color cells in the skin. But in this grasshopper, every one of the outer layer of cells of the body is a color cell. On the surface are granules of black pigment, underneath granules of blue. These change places in response to temperature changes. At approximately 25 degrees Celsius, the blue granules rise to the top, displacing the black. At 15 Celsius, the reverse happens. This displacement can be brought about only by temperature change. Australian entomologists have in vain tried every other sort of stimulus, including illumination with various wavelengths of light. The phenomenon probably is protective. Seemingly, because it is very cold at night on the high mountain top, the black pigment absorbs and retains all the heat available. It is as if the grasshopper carried a woolen blanket. With sunrise, an abrupt change takes place, and the days often become intensely hot. If the black coat were retained, the grasshopper would become overheated and probably die. The blue reflects much of the heat. With the first streaks of sunlight, grasshoppers, which have slept all night at the foot of grass stalks, begin creeping slowly upward. There apparently is no nervous control of the color change. Each color cell seems to act independently. The same reaction takes place in dead grasshoppers when the temperature changes, affecting even fragments of their bodies. It is possible to get a grasshopper half black and half blue by heating one end and cooling the other. End of section 141. Section 142 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Beetles That Helped an Army During the invasion of Normandy in 1944, army jeep drivers, prohibited from using headlights of any sort, were able to follow winding country roads on the blackest nights by rows of millions of flashing green lights which outlined the roadsides. Wingless, worm-like female beetles, Lampyrus hoctiluca, the European glowworm, were trying to attract their winged, lightless mates. Their nocturnal love-making, as they clung to roadside weeds and bushes, was a far from insignificant factor in the Normandy operations. The worms indicated not only the direction but the width of the roads, thus forestalling fatal accidents and preventing drivers from going astray into hostile territory. However, they doubtless proved of equal value to the enemy. These accommodating creatures, unknown to soldiers from across the Atlantic, should not be confused with our familiar fireflies. End of section 142. Read by Sandra. Section 143 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Worms in Medical History. Earthworms have an important place in folk medicine, especially in the Near East. Vizata Lequilet of Hamad, Allah, an ancient Persian natural history, states Earthworms are red worms living in the damp earth. Baked and eaten with bread, they reduce the size of stones in the bladder. When dried and eaten, they cure the yellowness of jaundice. In difficult labor, they bring on delivery immediately. Their ashes, applied to the head with oil of roses, makes the hair to grow. Says a 17th century English medical treatise, Earthworms are hot of nature, and of them are a precious ointment made to close wounds. And if they be sodden in goose grease and steined, it is a good ointment for to drop into a dull hearing ear. Earthworms stamped are good for pained teeth. 
the oil of earthworms be greatly commended for comforting of sinews joints veins and gout they must be washed in white wine and the oils of herbascum are cowslip of roses of lilies of dill of chamomile all sodden together when it is cold put in your earthworms stop your glass let it stand sixty days in the sun then strain it it will make an excellent oil against ache sciatica gout etc End of section 143. Section 144 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Toads That Make Poison Gas. Among the weirdest of American amphibians are certain of the giant toads of southwestern United States and northern Mexico, which, when frightened or in pain, diffuse a deadly gas which will kill objects some distance away. A very large toad found almost everywhere throughout the Panama Canal Zone can squirt a poison which may permanently blind a man if it hits the eyes. Nobody would bother it except from this skin is made the softest and most expensive of all leather. Most toads have skin covered with warts which are more closely grouped on the sides of the neck than elsewhere. These together with the parotid glands situated behind the eyes secrete a milky poisonous fluid whenever the animal is molested. The secretion is an acid irritant causing pain and cuts and producing a bitter astringent sensation in the mouth. End of section 144. Section 145 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Plants that thrive on ice bloom. There are plants that grow in ice and snow. This phenomenon, known to botanists as cryovegetation, has been the subject of intensive study at Mount McKinley National Park in Alaska. The plants are responsible for the strange phenomenon of ice bloom. Ice fields at various seasons take strange colors. The plants are very minute members of the almost universal algae family which are among the most primitive forms of life on earth. They are able to extract the nourishment they require from the surface of a glacier as it melts slightly under the glare of the Arctic sun. The phenomenon has been reported by Arctic explorers for many years, but until a few years ago, very little was known of the responsible microorganisms. They are a striking demonstration of the fact that life has spread to all possible habitats on earth in some form or other, even to fields of solid ice. While nobody is like to stake out a few thousand acres of glacier for a farm, an Hungarian botanist, Dr. Erspit Kohl, has made first-hand studies of the conditions under which the minute plant organism could live and multiply, including the acidity of the ice. Concerning the Columbia Glacier, one of the largest in the Alaska ice fields, Dr. Kohl reported to the Smithsonian Institution, when I stepped on the ice, I saw for the first time a phenomenon to be seen only on coastal glaciers. The surface of the ice was covered for miles and miles with light brownish-purple algal vegetation called ice bloom. This effect is produced by immense quantities of minute plants called encyclonema, a characteristic plant of the permanent ice. It can never be found elsewhere, even on permanent snow. It belongs to the green algae first found on the coast glaciers of Greenland. Since that time, the microorganism has been found in several localities in Europe, and I have found it occasionally on the glaciers of the interior, but never in sufficient quantities to form the ice bloom of the coastal glaciers. Here I had an opportunity of studying another striking phenomenon of the permanent snow regions of Alaska, colored snow, especially red snow. Above Valdez, around the Thompson Pass, the snow fields glitter with a reddish color in the beginning of August. The snow was red, not only on the surface, but also to a depth of several inches, and even in one place to a depth of two feet, 
caused by the presence of millions of tiny plants, Clematomonas nivalis. The snow on Thompson Pass looks as though it has been sprinkled with red pepper, differing in this respect from the red of other snowfields, which is usually a light raspberry red. End of section 145. Section 146 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Poison Arrow Frogs. There is a green frog about the size of a half dollar that is one of the most virulent, poisonous creatures on earth, but only after it has been roasted alive. It is common at the Smithsonian Institution's Tropical Wildlife Preserve in the Panama Canal Zone. When living, it is quite harmless, at least to human beings, although some believe it can poison other frogs. When it is roasted over a slow fire, however, a toxin is exuded from its skin which is a potent nerve and respiratory poison. It once was used by the Chaco Indians to poison the arrows with which they hunted game and Spaniards. The poison arrow frog is a delicate creature which is confined to a narrow temperature range and probably never has reached the United States alive. A ground and tree dwelling animal, it is quite elusive. A close relative is a brilliant scarlet frog a denizen of the treetop of the dense Panama rainforest. From its skin also is exuded a virulent poison. One of the two jungle canopy frogs, it is less than an inch long. Its body has deep scarlet both above and below. Its feet are black and its thighs are flecked with metallic green on the rear and metallic blue on the front. It is found only on the Atlantic side of the isthmus, near the mouth of a small bay where Columbus once landed for fresh water. Outside its narrow range, the creature has never been seen in its gorgeous colors. In captivity, it probably would die very quickly. Placed in a preservative, it quickly turns into a drab, uniform black. The animal is a remarkable and peculiar climber. It ascends a tree trunk by a series of short jumps, catching its toes in rough spots on the bark. Other tree frogs have suction discs on their feet by means of which they can walk up a tree in leisurely fashion. It makes its way unerringly from the ground to its treetop home, a pool of water in the axle of a bromeliad, or tank plant, a tree of the pineapple family. End of section 146. Section 147 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jim Lauder. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Seal That Can Lose Its Head. An animal that can pull its head almost completely into its neck has recently been added to the mammal collections of the Smithsonian Institution. This is the Ross seal, one of the rarest of all the seal family in the Antarctic. A frozen specimen captured by the Navy's Polar Expedition in 1956 arrived at the U.S. National Museum in Washington in excellent condition. This seal, about eight feet long, dwells exclusively on the drifting ice pack of the Ross Sea. So far as is known, it never comes on land or on the ice shelf. It apparently feeds almost exclusively on cuttlefish and squid, which are abundant in Antarctic waters. To judge by the nature of its teeth, it undoubtedly is not a fish eater. It is yellowish green on the underside and blackish brown on the top, the fur often being marked with pale streaks along the sides. On the drifting pack, it has fearsome enemies, notably the killer whale and the writhing snake-like sea leopard, most savage of the seal family, which may account for its relative scarcity. The outstanding peculiarity of the creature, probably unique among mammals, is the thick bloated neck into which the head can be withdrawn. This may be a protective characteristic, although it could hardly serve the creature against its fierce enemies. On the other hand, 
Withdrawal of the head may be a comfortable habit in a very cold climate. End of section 147. Section 148 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Delectable Horned Viper All along the Nile and the Red Sea coast is found the horned viper, which lives buried worm-like in the sand, with only its eyes and the upper part of its head visible. Its horns are said to look like barley grains and to entice birds. It is found often in rodent holes. This horned viper is extremely tenacious of life. It has been kept alive in a glass jar without food for two years. It can hurl itself forward as much as three feet. A full-grown specimen is about 18 inches long and quite poisonous, but Egyptian magicians have been seen eating the animals like stalks of celery. End of section 148 Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 5th of March, 2022. Section 149 of The Strangest Things of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lore, The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Flying Snakes, Frogs, and Toads. There are flying snakes as well as flying frogs and toads. Such reptiles and amphibians should be considered expert parachutists rather than actual flyers. The tree snakes, Dendrolophus and Chrysopelia, leap from high limbs stretched out lengthwise and both flatten and broaden the body so that it presents a concave surface. They glide to earth slowly at an angle to the vertical, and land apparently without injury. Frogs of some species have enormous webs between the fingers and toes, which serve as parachutes. A Brazilian tree frog has been observed to drop from an altitude of 100 feet and land 90 feet away uninjured. Since other frogs of the same size were killed when dropped vertically, Parachuting must be considered a distinct trait of this particular species, developed over many generations of life in treetops. In the course of experiments, a South Carolina lizard, frequenter of bushes and fences, landed 10 to 12 feet away from the place where it was dropped, at a height of 37 feet, and hopped away unhurt. It took a rigid posture when dropped limbs outstretched and stomach taut. It fell vertically a third of the distance to the ground and then started to glide. A lizard of another species from the same habit wriggled all the way down. End of section 149. Section 150 of The Strangest Things in the World this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Eagles Build Log Cabin Nests The white-headed eagle became the national bird of the United States by Act of Congress on June twentieth, 1782, for nearly two centuries it has remained the American symbol of fearlessness and freedom. 
the same bird Calioletus leucocephalus and not the more familiar golden eagle found in the west had been the supreme totem animal of the six nations of the iroquois from whom many institutions of the new republic indirectly may have been derived this eagle still is fairly abundant in the fringes of forest around the great lakes its fishing grounds its nest almost always at the top of a tall sycamore or hickory which is dead or dying is almost literally a log cabin the bird sometimes uses sticks six feet long for the outer walls it grasps large dead branches in its talons breaks them off by sheer force and flies away with them a recently observed nest was nine feet high and six feet in diameter End of section 150, read by Sandra. Section 151 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tia Wright. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Predatory Mantid. Why does the praying mantid pray? The prayer like pose of this near relative of the cockroach is its normal position both for seizing its victims and for defending itself. For their size, mantids are among the most predatory animals in existence. They are also among the least known of the insects. There are more than 1,500 species in the world, mostly tropical. Only 19 are known in the United States, which is on the northern fringe of their normal habitat. One of the most remarkable features of the mantid is its front legs, which bear sharp spines and fold in a curious hinged fashion, enabling the insect to reach forward, seize a fly or some other victim, and bring it to its mouth. This is the explanation for the seeming attitude of prayer. Mantids feed entirely on other animals, chiefly insects caught alive. Instances of small birds, lizards, and mice being eaten have been reported, probably due to mistaken observations. There is no question that mature individuals of several species can handle any caterpillar, grasshopper, cockroach, or other large insect that comes within its range. Their appetite is enormous. An adult mantid has been known to eat ten cockroaches in less than three hours. Bees and wasps usually have no terrors for the predators, although occasionally a mantid is stung while trying to catch a wasp and gives evidence of the injury. Sometimes the mantid's front legs are held in a posture of sparring rather than of prayer. More than once, the sight of one of these insects sparring with an English sparrow or some other small animal has attracted a crowd on a city street and gotten paragraphs in the local newspaper. The mantid usually waits motionless until its prey comes within reach, but sometimes, supposedly when very hungry, it may stalk another insect. Sometimes the victim is touched lightly with the antenna before the front legs flash forward and make the capture. These insects have developed considerable camouflage. Some tropical species look like flowers, their colors blending with those of foliage. One species varies in color from white to pale pink and has the practice of crouching among certain blossoms, the petals of which its legs and other body parts resemble. Others have arranged themselves on plants so that they look like blue flowers. Presumably, bees and other flower-loving insects thus are lured to their doom. A few tropical mantids have developed a superficial resemblance to other insects of the same environment, which are distasteful to birds and monkeys. Some closely resemble large ants. There is a widespread belief that the male always is eaten by the female after mating. Sometimes this happens, but the male never is a willing victim and quite frequently escapes. The eggs are laid in groups of from a dozen to about 400. They are deposited in layers in the midst of a thick, frothy liquid which soon hardens and becomes fibrous. For the most part, each species deposits egg masses of a distinctive shape. On the whole, they probably are beneficial insects because the greater part of their prey consist of species injurious to gardens. The possibility of propagating them for the control of injurious insects, such as Japanese beetles, has been suggested because of their notoriously big appetites. 
It would, however, be impossible to restrict them to a specific pest. They would continue to eat about every living creature of the right size that came within reach of their claws, including many beneficial species. End of section 151. Section 152 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Fireflies as Electricians. The flashing of a field of fireflies is an expensive show. For two generations, one of the ideals of science has been to produce artificially cold light, radiation confined entirely to those wavelengths to which the retina of the human eye is sensitive, without any energy being wasted in the form of heat or invisible light. Could the ideal be attained with the same expenditure of fuel and power as is required for light production at present, the world's bills for illumination would be decreased enormously. Actually, the firefly has attained this ideal in one direction it emits only visible light. From this point of view, the firefly, or any other sort of luminescent animal, is very efficient indeed. A good part of the total radiation from any man-made source of light, or for that matter from the sun, is invisible infrared, observable only as heat. Possibly the firefly produces some heat in its light production, but it is too little to be measured. It is safe to say that within a tiny fraction, 100% of the radiation produced is in the visible spectrum most of it shorter wavelengths than those which produce the sensation of blue light. This is by far the highest efficiency known to science. Chemists can duplicate the process to a certain extent. Consequently, a great deal of research has been devoted to the light-emitting mechanism, physical and chemical, of the insects. Firefly luminescence is due to the oxidation, that is, the burning, of a chemical substance, luciferin. This reaction, in turn, depends upon a catalyst known as luciferase. The same phenomenon can be brought out by appropriate mixtures of luciferin, luciferase, and oxygen in a test tube at the proper temperature. All these experiments have shown that, considering the amount of oxygen necessary, it is a very wasteful process. It is far less efficient than most means of producing artificial light known to man. 1% compared with the 4.54% of the carbon filament. 17.17% of the acetylene flame, or 60% of the sodium arc light. To illuminate houses or streets with firefly light would be a very expensive procedure indeed. Dr. N. D. Maloff of Yale University quotes a calculation that an area of firefly light six feet in diameter on the ceiling of a room nine feet high would give ample illumination for reading or drawing on a table three feet high. This would hardly interest an illuminating engineer. The light can, however, be used in an emergency. During the Spanish-American War, Major General W.C. Gorgas is reputed to have used the light from a bottle of fireflies to perform an emergency operation. The average householder would rebel at the monthly bills. The actual light from a single firefly is very minute indeed, averaging little more than 25 thousandths of a candle power. The combined courtship efforts of a whole field full of the insects would hardly light a single room enough for sewing or reading. The insect will sometimes glow steadily with a light as low as two hundred thousandths of candle power intensity. Among fireflies, flashing is essentially a courtship phenomenon. Yet there is no discernible difference between the quality of the light of male and female insects. What actually happens is that the flash of the female in response to the signal of the male is timed almost exactly at a trifle over two seconds. The male is instinctively aware of this time interval, so that he does not become confused with the signals of other males. In a large group of insects, the flashes of the two sexes tend to become synchronized, producing a field of light. End of section 152. Section 153 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. 
the mollusk vampire of hell. Black demon of the realm of everlasting dark and vampira tuthus infernalis. Most nightmarish of living animals, this vampire of hell has a midnight black body about two inches long, red-brown round face on a head almost as large as the rest of the body, red eyes, and an inch in diameter encircled by narrow bands of pinkish orange, rows of ivory white teeth, tin wriggling, ever probing tentacles extending from the head. On the sides of the neck are two powerful flashing lights, each of which is a cluster of about fifty tiny phosphorescent nodules. The entire body is covered with hundreds of tiny lights. Fortunately, nobody is likely to meet this horror of an hallucination damned maniac's ravings on a lonely road passing a graveyard at night. It is a mollusk, a close relative of the octopus and the squid, but belonging to neither family, which lives in abysses of subtropical seas all around the world, far below the depths reached by most penetrating green rays of the sun. Only its relatively small size and restricted habitat prevent it from being the most fearsome, loathsome creature on this planet. The vampire is a living fossil, survivor out of the demonic seas of 200 million years ago which found shelter from the inexorable scythe with which time mows down demons by retreating further and further into the dark. Imprints of quite similar sea animals, probably denizens of warm, shallow waters, have been found in English rocks. Up to now about a hundred individuals have taken from the deep sea mostly by scientific expeditions. Of these, nearly two-thirds have come from the Atlantic, off the Florida coast, and near Bermuda, there are several in the Smithsonian collections. The fantastically terrible little mollusk was first taken in the Indian Ocean by Dr. Carl Kuhn of the German Valdavia Expedition about 75 years ago. Until quite recently, all specimens obtained have been in poor condition, and there have been considerable difficulty in classifying them. The job has been complicated by the fact that the vampire apparently undergoes a series of metamorphoses which have been mistaken for different species, during the past ten years, however, they have been studied intensively by Dr. Grace Pickford of the Bingham Oceanographic Laboratory of Yale, and their fearsome reality has been established beyond question. Naturally, since the living animal cannot be observed, essentially little is known of its habits and ways of life. Certainly it is a voracious carnivore like all others of its race, and preys upon every other creature of the depths in its size range. It seems to be confined exclusively to a depth of about 1,500 meters. This is the level of the sea where, for some reason, oceanographers are unable to fathom the oxygen content of the water is lowest. It goes up immediately both above and below. The vampire apparently cannot stand too much oxygen. Its eggs sink to about 2,000 meters where they reach their suspension level. As soon as the little mollusks hatch, they rise to their natural habitat. The vampire has powerful tentacles, but its fin muscles indicate that it is a weak swimmer. It probably lurks in the abysmal darkness for its prey to come within reach of the probing tentacles. Even with its enormous eyes and its many lights, it hardly can distinguish moving objects very well, and presumably is not particular about what living things it eats. Its usual victims probably are fishes and smaller mollusks. It is unlikely that the creature has had many natural enemies it need fear. Unlike the octopuses, its nearest relations. It has no ink sac from which to discharge a black cloud around its body for its own concealment. End of section 153. Section 154 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Climbing and Flying Frogs A family of frogs that climbs trees, burrow, and are learning to fly are the tree frogs of Mexican tropical forests. Various members of the family are at different stages in their physical adaptation to tree life. They constitute a striking example of evolution at work as a race struggles to shake itself free from one environment and conquer another despite considerable odds. The ends of the fingers and toes of those frogs are provided with adhesive discs by means of which the animals are able to obtain a firm foothold on relatively smooth surfaces. These discs are used mainly for climbing or for clinging to foliage and limbs when jumping. 
One species is both a climber and burrower. It is an extremely timid little creature and a poor climber, but it buries itself deeply in tree mosses. Another species, which seems as much as home on the ground as in the trees, deposits its eggs on the upper surfaces of leaves overhanging the water. The tadpoles, which must return to the water for their metamorphosis into frogs, simply drop off the leaves after they leave the eggs. Perhaps the most peculiar of the family is the marsupial frog, Gastrothica, all of whose young are sheltered in a pouch on the back of the female. Some of the family lay their eggs in nests of froth attached to leaves. One remarkable species seems to be developing the ability to fly. Its hind limbs are elongated for jumping, and it has been known to leap and alight without injury from a height of 140 feet. When handled, it exudes a poisonous, milky fluid which coagulates instantly, sticking to the fingers in a disagreeable way. It has a strong odor like that of peaches, which causes the inside of the nose to itch. Experiments are described in which this animal was dropped from the top of a high water tower. It immediately spread out its limbs and, instead of dropping vertically, sailed slowly downward and landed uninjured on the ground about 90 feet away. Apparently, it was able to get the best of gravity after a drop of about 12 feet. From that point on, there was no apparent acceleration in the speed of descent. A state of equilibrium was reached. Whenever one of these frogs was thrown in the air, it invariably managed, after a violent struggle, to establish itself in a balanced position which it could maintain, apparently without effort, while it glided to the ground. Within certain limits, these tree frogs can change their color so that their bodies will blend more perfectly with their surroundings. One of the most widely distributed Mexican species seems to have an exceptional color range. This particular creature also is notable for its elusiveness. It exists in countless numbers, yet an explorer may hunt for weeks without encountering a single one. Such was the experience of the German naturalist Hans Gadow. While wandering along the edge of the forest, he heard what seemed to be the noise of a sawmill in the distance. As he came nearer, the sound changed into a roar like that of steam escaping from many boilers, mingled with the sharp and piercing scream of saws. It came from a meadow containing a shallow rainwater pool in which were tens of thousands of large green tree frogs. Gadow calculated that in this pool, about 30 yards square and in the immediate neighborhood, were more than 45,000 of the creatures. The water of the pool was covered with their spawn, a minimum of 100 million eggs. The next morning, there was not a single frog in sight. The water had evaporated during the night, and the eggs were left to be cooked by the sun. One of the most curious of these creatures is the banana frog, whose habitat often is the upper side of a banana leaf. It is an extremely elusive creature whose color undergoes considerable change without being specifically responsive, so far has been observed to the intensity of light. Another curious member of the family wraps its eggs in foamy leather and suspends the whole mass between leaves or blades of grass over water in such a manner that the next heavy rain washes the developing eggs or tadpoles into it. It is necessary that the tadpole stage be passed in water. Development of means to bring this about was necessary before the family could conquer a tree environment. Another little frog spends its entire life in the leaf-formed cup of a bromelia, a plant somewhat similar in appearance to a small century plant, which grows on the branches of trees where its roots get a precarious foothold. During the rainy season, this cup becomes filled with water. There the frog lays its eggs, which hatches polywogs. Truly demonic are fantastic horn frogs of Brazil, which devour other amphibians and small mammals. The largest of them do not hesitate to defy a human being in the mountain rainforest, their chief habitat. They are six inches long or longer and as broad as long. Some have horns on their eyelids and the tips of their noses. All have enormous mouths so that a mouse can be swallowed quite easily. When excited, they inflate their bodies like balloons and utter bull-like bellows. At other times, they are heard to cry like infants. The horns probably serve no other purpose than to add to the ferocious appearance of the animals. They are just hardened extensions of the skin, entirely too soft to be of any value in combat. All species of horned frogs are rare in collections. They seldom are seen because of their secluded habitat and their clever camouflage. They throw loose dirt over their damp bodies until they become practically invisible. Rarest of the family are the pygmy horned frogs, which have horns on both eyelids and the tip of the nose, as well as a fringe of horns around the eyes. They are beautifully marked animals. End of section 154. Section 155 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Mad Dog Cycles. There may be mad dog cycles, 
Dogs are much more vicious in June than in the so-called dog days season of July and August. The tiny poodle and the Pekingese share with the German police dog and the Italian bull rank among the 10 most vicious of domestic canines. These are some of the conclusions reached by Dr. Robert Olison of the U.S. Public Health Service on the basis of data about dogs in the metropolitan New York area for 27 years. During this period, Dr. Olison's study shows that there were two five-year peaks in rabies from 1911 to 1915 inclusive and from 1926 to 1930. During the first period, the annual average of bites diagnosed as made by rabies-infected animals was 233, compared with only an average of 78 for the previous three years for which records were available. There followed a period of 10 years during which the number of rabies cases diagnosed in biting dogs averaged only 43 a year. Starting with 1926, the curve leaped up again, and in the next five years, there was an average of 288 cases a year. Then came another rapid decline. Apparently, the number of rabies cases has no relation to the number of bites. These remained practically stationary at an average of about 3,500 from 1908 to 1926. There was a sudden jump to more than 7,000 cases in 1925, just before the start of the second rabies peak. But since 1930, the number of bites reported has continued to go up in the face of rigid muzzling restrictions until it has reached the alarming figure of 20,000. At the same time, the number of rabies cases rapidly has gone down. The same tendency toward the mag-dog cycle has been noted in several European countries. It may be due to an inexplicable waxing and waning of the virulency of the rabies virus. During the peak years, extraordinary efforts were made to impound all unlicensed dogs, and the decline of the waves may have been due to the lessening of the number of potential rabies carriers by this means. Contrary to general belief, Dogs are getting better tempered rapidly during dog days. The high peak of the year in bites is reached about the middle of June. Then comes a very sharp drop, which continues steadily as colder weather comes on. No breed of dogs is entirely free from the biting tendency, but some are much more prone to it than others. The mongrel doesn't rank among the really vicious dogs, and pedigree counts for nothing. The ten breeds in the order of frequency of their reported bites are German Police, Chow, Poodle, Italian Bull, Fox Terrier, Cross Chow, Airedale, Pekingese, and cross-German police dog. End of section 155. Section 156 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry, The Amazing Survival of the Opossum. The opossum, sole survivor in the new world of a primitive and very ancient family, represents an overlooked principle in evolution, survival by endurance. How this clumsy, persecuted animal has endured through millions of generations in the midst of savages and hungry foes is the subject of a revealing study by Dr. J.D. Black of the University of Kansas. Dr. Black examined closely the skeletons of 95 opossums in the University Museum, all killed in the immediate vicinity. 39 of them gave evidence of broken bones that had completely healed. One specimen had suffered and recovered from breaks of both scapula, 11 ribs, two broken in three places, and a badly injured spine. Still another gave evidence of having suffered at the same time fractures of the jaw, the scapula, and nine ribs. Many showed evidence of ribs and scapula broken in several places. The ability to survive such severe injuries, they would be fatal in any other animal either in themselves or because the crippled condition resulting from them would make a creature an easy prey to its enemies, illustrates the importance of the opossum's practice of playing dead. The opossum represents an important stage in the evolution of mammals, that of the marsupials or pouch bearers. They presumably were quite widely distributed over the earth at one time before the emergence of the placental type of mammals to which the human race belongs, together with almost all other warm-blooded animals. They may be the ancestors of the placentals, or they may represent a different line of development from the ancestral reptiles. In any event, they are considerably nearer the type of those ancient egg-laying reptiles. They are just a step beyond the egg-laying stage. When the placentals arose, the marsupials quickly disappeared from most of the earth. They were not so well adapted for survival in conflict with the more advanced, efficient type of animal. Only in Australia did they find a haven. With a single exception, they were the only mammals there when the continent first was discovered by white men. This has led to the speculation that Australia was cut off from the rest of the world before the placental races were evolved 
or before they had attained such efficiency in the ways of life as to enable them to survive. There the marsupials, without competition, were able to survive and differentiate into rich fauna of the continent, of which the kangaroos are considered the most characteristic animals. The one exception was in North and South America in the person of the lowly opossum. All the mediating animals which arose around the creature fed upon it if they could catch it. It was not very efficient in getting away from a pursuer. It developed no effective armor like the shell of the armadillo or the quills of the porcupine with which other weak animals managed to survive. It was not even very efficient at hiding. When man arrived on the scene with his bows and his guns, its last havens, the treetops, lost their small measure of security. All the cards were stacked against the survival of the opossum, but it developed a means of its own to keep a tenacious hold on life, while far more efficient creatures, beset with new enemies and changing climates, were forced to give up. The great mammoth herds, lords of the earth for a million years, disappeared. The ferocious saber-toothed tiger and the great cave bear expired by the roadside in the race of evolution. But the poor opossum had discovered the important principle that the meek shall inherit the earth, or at least be allowed to live in it. It became the great pain endurer and lived by submitting and gritting its teeth. It didn't fight nor hide. It merely suffered and learned how to endure suffering. This supreme ability of the opossum to recover from injuries goes a long way toward explaining its survival. The opossum thus appears to be the prototype of a familiar class of men and women. They are frequently encountered. As children, they have almost every conceivable disease. Their adolescence is a continuous succession of broken bones. Their parents despair of raising them. When they come to adult life, the story is much the same. They suffer a constant stream of misfortunes, physical and otherwise. Physicians are amazed at their recoveries, and they often survive into the 80s and 90s of life while the healthy, fortunate individuals with whom they started out are left behind in the prime of life, victims of pneumonia, heart disease, or accident. When the latter die, the news comes as a surprise to their acquaintances who cannot understand how the strong die and the weak survive. They ponder over the paradox that strength is weakness and weakness strength. The ancient opossum might explain that paradox if it had the means to express itself. End of section 156. Section 157 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Mammal Prototypes of the Mermaid. The prototypes of the mermaids of legend are among the least known of all animals to naturalists because of their underwater habitat and their secretive habits. They are the manatees of the Caribbean region and the dugongs of the Indian Ocean. They constitute the only remaining species of the sirenia, or moon creatures, distant relatives of the elephant. Both have a somewhat human facial appearance. They feed standing upright in the water, their flippers held out before them like arms. Sometimes the females hold their calves in these flippers. Seen from a distance, they have a curiously human appearance, which may account for the many reports of mermaids and mermen. This is especially true of the dugong, a creature of the open sea with a white, almost hairless body. It is extremely secretive and has almost never been captured alive. When one is washed ashore or caught in a fisher's net, it causes superstitious fear among the natives. The manatees are not so human in appearance and are much better known. The creatures seldom make their appearance above water in daylight. They prefer to gaze in the moonlight, and this is added to their human-like appearance which has given rise to the mermaid legends. One of the few persons to study the animal at close range, O.W. Barrett, an American explorer, tells us the following concerning the manatee. The animal still is fairly common in most freshwater bayous, lagoons, and rivers along the east coast of Nicaragua. One of the best-known herds on the Caribbean coast inhabits the Indio River, just north of Greytown, Nicaragua. Estimates of its number vary from a few score to several hundred. The herd apparently is stationary there and does not increase or decrease to any notable degree from year to year, although the natives take a heavy toll. A manatee can remain underwater from 20 to 30 minutes when frightened. During the daytime, the slightest unusual noise, like rain falling on a tin pail or the spitting of the hunter, is sufficient to keep the whole herd submerged for hours, yet while they are grazing, the hunter may go up and slap them on the back unnoticed. Families consisting of a bull, a cow, and one or two calves usually merge into a herd of from 10 to 50 or more individuals living in a certain stretch of river, concentrating during the day and scattering at night. They generally graze at night, although a few individuals may be seen feeding in broad daylight. 
The body is held nearly vertical while grazing. The head is held well out of water, while the arm-like flippers poke the grass toward the mouth. The noise made by the flapping of the huge upper lip and the crunching of the large teeth can be heard distinctly 200 yards or more away. The sound is much like that of horses grazing in a pasture. Adult manatees appear to average somewhere between 8 and 10 feet in length. Some, old females presumably, may reach 12 feet. A much more seclusive animal is the true mermaid of legend, the dugong of the open ocean. Unlike the manatee, it is a creature of the sea and seldom ventures into the freshwater rivers and lagoons. Few naturalists ever have actually seen one of the creatures. Mr. Barrett's first acquaintance with the creature came in Mozambique, Portuguese East Africa, when some native fishermen caught in their net what they described as a white porpoise. They were terrified and gladly presented their catch to an Italian blacksmith. This man crudely embalmed the animal, placed it in a rough coffin, and freighted it to Johannesburg, where he rented a showroom and made a fortune exhibiting the only genuine mermaid, half fish, half human. For many years, mariners in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea have told of seeing objects resembling women standing waist-high on the surface. Zoologists of the Middle Ages described a bishop fish which had been seen standing with outstretched arms supposedly blessing the waters. In nearly every case, it seems likely, the objects were strange water animals, the dugongs. They have a curious resemblance to human beings, especially naked women, when seen from a distance. Nearly all mermaid stories have originated in water where dugongs are abundant. Spanish and Portuguese sailors, the first Europeans to encounter the animal, called it the woman fish. The creature is best known to Malagasy fishermen of Madagascar who, while they prize its flesh highly, attribute to it human qualities and affinities. After catching one, the fisherman must perform various religious rites, and before he is allowed to sell the fish at a public market, he must take an oath that there have been no unnatural relations between himself and his mermaid victim. The female's breasts are roughly in about the position of those of women. She has the habit of rising about halfway out of the water and sometimes has been described as holding her baby in her flippers. Little is known of the life history and habits of the dugong. It is a creature of the shallow sea which never has survived long in captivity. It seems to share with the elephant and with man the faculty of shedding tears when it is in trouble or pain. One which was kept for several months in the Colombo Zoo in Ceylon constantly was weeping. Malagasy fishermen used to torture the animals in order to collect the tears which they sold as love charms. Another extant member of the mermaid family is the manatee found on both sides of the Atlantic in the warm freshwater rivers of Africa and South America. Although never mistaken for a human, it is accorded considerable superstitious regard. The Caliboy of Nigeria regarded as a sacred animal and the incarnation of a human soul. If a fisherman kills one by accident or otherwise, he must undergo an elaborate cleansing ceremony, which involves offerings before images of his ancestors and remaining indoors for three days. During this period, he is rubbed from head to foot with a yellow pigment by women of his family. While the purgative rites are in progress, the women sing at dawn and dusk. On the third day, there is a feast on the meat, but a bit must be given to every household in the village to lay upon the shrines of ancestors. Both Manatee and Dugong, and formerly the extinct sea cow of Bering Sea, are probably the closest living relatives of the elephant. They have similar brain and heart structure. The molar teeth of the mermaid family are like those of early elephants. The male Dugong has tusks. There also is a great extension of the upper lip, which overlaps the side of the mouth, a start in the direction of a trunk. The next nearest relatives of the elephants are the high races or conies of Africa and Syria, best known in the form of expensive fur coats. They look and act like rabbits. A Hebrew prophet made them symbolic of timidity. Only a taxonomist would suspect these little creatures could claim any kinship to the largest of land mammals. End of section 157. Section 158 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Limbless Lizards and Glass Snakes A supposedly welcome guest in the underground chambers of leafcutter ants is the Amphisbana, a nearly limbless lizard about a foot long which looks somewhat like a gigantic earthworm. These creatures, seldom seen, can be found from Brazil north to Lower California and there is one isolated species in Florida. Those brought to me, observed the noted British naturalist and explorer of Brazil, Henry Walter Bates, were generally not much more than a foot in length. They are of cylindrical shape having, properly speaking, no neck, and the blunt tail, which is only about an inch in length, is of the same shape as the head. 
This peculiar form, added to their habit of wriggling backwards as well as forwards, has given rise to the fable that they have two heads, one at each extremity. They are extremely sluggish in their motions, and are clothed with scales that have the form of small embedded plates arranged in rings around the body. The eye is so small as to be scarcely perceptible. They live habitually in the subterranean chamber of the Saba ant, only coming out of their abodes occasionally in the night time. The natives call the Amphisbena the Maidas Salbas, or Mother of Salbas, and believe it to be poisonous, although it is perfectly harmless. They say the ants treat it with great affection, and that if the snake be taken away from the nest, the ants also will forsake it. I believe, however, that they feed on the Salbas, for I once found remains of the ants in the stomach of one of them. Their motions are quite peculiar. The undulatable jaws, small eyes, and curious plated integument distinguish them from other snakes. These properties evidently have some relation to their residence in the subterranean abodes. Closely related is the Florida worm lizard, rose-colored and completely legless and earless. It is about a foot long and looks so much like an earthworm that expert collectors have been fooled. A peculiarity is that it always goes down into a burrow tail first. The Arizona worm lizard, a somewhat fabulous animal of the same family, is not, so far as is known, represented in any collection. One veteran miner told of dragging a purple snake with two legs on its neck from the gravel. A woman claimed to have kept it as a pet for three months, a purple snake with its legs where its ears ought to be. All these animals are in the same general family as the glass snakes of Europe and the United States. These are long, slender, legless lizards. They are burrowing animals, which occasionally are turned up by plowmen, but they often come to the surface voluntarily at night. Specimens occasionally found in daylight usually are hiding in dark recesses. Each animal consists of apparently quite separate parts, body, and tail. The body is from 6 inches to a foot long, according to species, and the tail may be twice as long. The animal can disengage its tail by a single twist when caught by that organ. The slightest injury or rough handling causes this tail to fly to pieces. Each piece wriggles energetically, supposedly to attract attention while the lizard itself crawls to safety in its burrow. The body does not break up and does not, as popularly reputed, come back later to gather up fragments of its tail. Instead, it grows a new tail, always smaller than the original from the stump. End of section 158. Section 159 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Only Bug in the Sea. Only one group of insects has taken to the sea, the small, gray, long-legged water striders. Unlike freshwater relatives of the same genus, these have permanently lost their wings. They have no further use for this means of movement in the ocean. Great numbers have been found floating and swimming in the open sea around Pacific Islands. Both nymphs and adults sometimes are blown onto the beaches by strong winds. They are awkward on land, seek shelter in any depression in the sand, and fall easy prey to birds and the multitude of ghost crabs which glide over the sands after dark. On the surface of shallow water, the insects are found in groups of hundreds of thousands. Apparently, they feed on plankton which rises to the surface at night. They themselves are not eaten by fish. This is probably due to scent glands which secrete a strong odor which is repellent to the ever-hungry vertebrates. In small embayments are found enormous numbers of one type of water strider, the female of which is less than a twelfth of an inch long. The male is considerably smaller and rides on the back of his mate to ensure that the two will not be separated by wind or tide. Insects are by far the most abundant of all land animals. The reasons why only one genus has invaded the sea have been the subject of much speculation. On the continents, insects are found in saltwater lakes where the saline concentration is much greater than in seawater. Other types live in torrential streams and waterfalls where they get much rougher treatment than would come from wave action. There are two probable reasons for the failure to invade the ocean. One is the fact that no insect ever has been able to live in very deep water. The bug race has evolved a special breathing mechanism admirably suited to life on land, but rather poorly adapted to life underwater. Besides, the seas have been taken over almost completely by the remote relatives of the insects, the crustaceans. These include, besides crabs and shrimps, the superabundant copepods, the lice of the ocean. Invaders from the land never have been able to compete with them. End of section 159. Section 160 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is 
a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. A Crocodile with Life After Death by Teal. There is an animal that can bite. It might even slash off a man's arm after it is dead. Alive, it is relatively inoffensive. Being killed makes it positively mad. Its uncanny ability to bite half an hour or more after its neck has been broken is a major risk for followers of one of the most adventurous of profession the jungle crocodile hunters their story is a saga paralleling that of the antarctic whalers who first told of moby dick one of the most expert of them is dr fred meadham smithsonian collaborator and professor of zoology at the university of Brograta. He has twice been bitten painfully by dead reptiles. The animal is the caiman, smaller than either alligator or crocodile, and probably more closely related to the former. Its hide, like that of its two fellow crocodilians, is valuable for leather, and during the past few years, it has been pursued close to extinction by professional hunters in Colombia and Brazilian jungles and lagoons. Dr. Meadham is an eminent zoologist. He doesn't believe, of course, that any animal that is completely dead can bite off a man's arm but he is hard put to explain what he himself has experienced. He thinks that part of the caiman's nervous system, which activates its snout and mouth, is somehow disconnected from the rest and does not die at the same time. Thus, the dead reptile has no consciousness when it bites. It is a reflex action of one small segment of the nervous system that somehow is not completely dead. There is only one way to be safe for an indefinite period after the caiman is killed. That is to shot a hole in its neck and run a pointed stick into the medulla obligata. The reflex action center at the base of the brain. When this is destroyed, the ability to bite is lost. One can proceed to skin the animal without fear of losing an arm or a finger. Ordinarily, this reptile will not attack a human, it lives on smaller animals wild and domestic pigs, and the pig-like capybaras that venture into the jungle rivers. Dr. Meadham has recently discovered a curious new subspecies of caimans, confined, so far as known, to the upper reaches of the Apaporus River, a tributary of the Amazon. It is much more crocodile-like in appearance than the rest of the family, with a very long, narrow snout. The others have broad, flat snouts. It retains prominent bony ridges over its eyes. One of the most striking characteristics that distinguish the caimans from both crocodiles and alligators. A much more dangerous animal is the Orinoco crocodile, a large reptile which lives only in the Orinoco and its tributaries 
and has a taste for human flesh. The creature is especially dangerous to bathers and to women doing their washing in the rivers. This is one of the two species of these dreaded reptiles known in South America. The other is a smaller, less aggressive creature of seashore rivers and lagoons. The inland species now is quite close to extermination. Until recently, it was pursued by both German and French companies of professional crocodile hunters. Now they have given up because the profits have become too small for the risk, period. The technique for hunting caimans and crocodiles is strikingly like that of the whale hunters and just as dangerous. The hunter goes out on the river with a boat at night. The boat carries searchlights which move over the surface of the water. Here and there appear glittering red and yellow spots. The red spots are the eyes of crocodiles. The yellow ones, eyes of caimans. The boat is propelled by jungle Indians who have developed the ability to paddle noiselessly. They row to within about two yards of a pair of glittering eyes. Then the hunter throws his harpoon, equipped with a special aiming apparatus. He has developed skill in hitting precisely the right spot, judged by the position of the eyes. For a crocodile, he aims at where the neck should be, for a caiman at the flank. The neck of the latter reptile is protected by heavy scales. A gun never is used. The wounded reptile simply would dive into deep water where its body could not be recovered. After the harpoon with a rope attach finds its mark there is a terrific struggle as the reptile tries to get into deep water the caiman finally is killed by chopping through its spinal cord with a machete that is everything is dead except the brain and the snout the spine of a crocodile is broken by a blow with a large axe just behind the shoulders. It stays dead. The caimans migrate over land from lagoon to lagoon during the dry season. When at last they find water, they dig holes in the mud and sleep until the heavy rains return. When they emerge and resume their normal ways of life. Quite exciting stories are told of persons who happen to meet migrating bands of these barbillos, creatures about three feet long. Ordinarily, they will not attack humans but they will not hesitate to do so if they feel they are threatened. Once one of them gets a grip, it is almost impossible to break away unless one happens to have a machete. End of section 160. Section 161 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Salamander that Lives Like a Worm 
There is an animal related to the salamander and the frog, which looks like a gigantic earthworm and lives an earthworm's life. It is seen so rarely that probably not one person in a million is aware of its existence. It is the Sicilian, a very ancient creature forming the third branch of the order of amphibians, which were probably the first backboned animals to establish themselves on land nearly 300 million years ago. There are about 50 species. Sicilians are found in most of tropical America, Africa, and Asia. They range in length from a few inches to nearly a yard. The larger ones might be mistaken either for titanic earthworms or small snakes. In the physical structure are combined features of both salamanders and frogs. These amphibians spend all their lives burrowing in the soil. They live chiefly on earthworms and come to the surface only for brief intervals after heavy rains. They usually are seen only by farmers who uncover them while ploughing or digging ditches. Since they are so easily mistaken for snakes, they are avoided, although they are entirely harmless. They have sharp teeth, but make no effort to bite when handled. Most of the Sicilians are egg layers, the large eggs being attached to one another like beads on a string and then wound up in a ball. This is incubated by the mother who coils herself around it. The burrows where the eggs are laid are always on a stream bank, since the young, like those of all amphibians, must pass part of their development stage in water. These amphibians probably are fairly abundant animals, Owing to the subterranean life, they are nearly, perhaps in some cases completely, blind. The amphiuma, a species of salamander, also is often mistaken for a snake. It spends most of its life in rivers buried in mud, where it lives on larvae and on fish eggs. Since it is an air-breathing creature, it must come to the surface frequently to breathe. The amphiuma has rudimentary legs, almost microscopic in size. This fact alone is enough to differentiate it from the snakes, who always are legless. This curious salamander is seldom encountered and is barely mentioned in standard textbooks of natural history. Confined to the southeastern United States, it often is considered a highly poisonous animal. Actually, it is harmless. Very rarely one is caught on a fish hook. It is so slippery that it is almost impossible to hold in the hand. The creature has some relatives which are not so secretive in their habits and are much better known. One is the giant salamander of China and Japan, the largest and most active of a race. It makes its home in crevices under rocks in running streams. Another is the mud puppy or hellbender, which sometimes gets on the hooks of fishermen in muddy streams. The amphiuma is a degenerate member of a family. It has almost lost its legs. It still retains its eyes, but these have become very small. The animal can have very little use for them. In India is found a worm-like Sicilian, Ichthyopis, which lives under stones and burrows after the fashion of earthworms. Superficially, it differs from an earthworm by its darker color. Its body is coated with slime and it leaves a trail of mucus behind it when it crawls. The earth snake, Silibura, is found in the same region. It usually is mistaken for a worm, especially by birds to their own discomfort and sometimes disaster. It ties itself in loops around a bird's feet, and these loops are quite difficult to loosen. Among natives, there is a superstition that if it coils around a child's finger, the only way to get rid of it is to amputate the member. End of section 161 Section 162 of The Strangest Things in the World this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerry Malazani. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Three-Eyed Lizards of New Zealand. Among sun-baked rocks on barren islands off the New Zealand coast basks a solitary survivor of the days before the dinosaurs. It is Earth's oldest backbone inhabitant, a fugitive in time from nature's harsh law of the survival of the fittest, the Tuatera, or Three-Eyed Lizard. Its big, dreamy hazel eyes have watched the procession of the ages for 300 million years. The beginning and extinction of the dinosaurs, to whom it stood in about the relationship of a great uncle, the coming of birds and mammals, Millenniums of famine and millenniums of plenty, the shattering and crashing together of continents. 
it has survived while all of its contemporaries of the Earth's ancient days have died. Largely because it has been willing placidly to watch the parade pass without bothering to take any part in a tumult and shouting. The feature of great interest about the Tuatera, both popularly and scientifically, is its third eye. This third or pineal eye is closer to its original form in the Tuatera than in any other living creature. Just after the little reptile is hatched, the organ appears as a dark spot under a film of thin, semi-transparent skin. In a baby Tuatera, it becomes a small knob on top of the head. Thick, opaque skin covers the eye in the adult reptile, and it is difficult to distinguish. Anatomists doubt whether the animal actually sees with the pineal eye anymore. The fact remains that this organ can be distinguished easily and that it retains, in degenerate form, the characteristics of a seeing eye, which has nerve connections with the visual cortex at the back of the brain. Moreover, when the third eye of an infant tuatera is dissected, there is clear evidence that it once was a double organ. The tuatera is about two feet long from its snout to the tip of its crocodile-like tail. It has a scaly skin and a row of spines along its back. Its large hazel eyes are its most conspicuous feature. They have a soft, dreamy expression, and they never appear to blink. There are no external ears, but the sense of hearing is highly developed. One way of drawing the creature from its burrow is to play a tune on almost any instrument. It does not dig its own holes under the rocks. Usually, it shares the burrow of a black and white petrel, known in New Zealand as the mutton bird, and it remains there even when the bird incubates its eggs and feeds its nestlings. Apparently, a mutually satisfactory arrangement has been reached between petrel and lizard. The former usually are in their nests only at night. The tuatera spends most of the night away from home, hunting for the insects which are its favorite food. Occasionally, it has been observed, a host will become tired of its persistent house guest and try to evict it. In such a case, the tuatera never puts up a fight. It leaves placidly and tries to find some other petrel with whom it can share quarters. If this search fails, it will, as a last extremity, scoop out its own burrow although apparently such labor is against its deeply fixed principles of making no effort which possibly can be avoided. The lizard goes to sleep about the middle of April, the beginning of winter in New Zealand, and wakes late in August when spring is well underway. Then, for seven months, it grows fat on insects. The creature is reportedly capable of living for 500 years and more. It shares its longevity with its distant relatives, the great turtles. Its long life, during most of which it continues to breed, doubtless has been a major factor in its racial survival. The ancient reptiles were plentiful when white men first came to New Zealand early in the last century. The Maori regarded them with superstitious awe and avoided them as much as possible. But early British settlers and their dogs used to kill the inoffensive creatures for sport. This was the first active enmity the Tuatera's has ever known. They saved themselves by withdrawing to the barren islands and becoming even more seclusive in their ways of life. Thus, they clung to a thin thread of existence until an enlightened government threw the protection of the law around them. Today, the three-eyed lizard is probably the world's most rigidly protected animal. The New Zealand government has placed all sorts of legal restrictions on hunting or capturing it, and to kill one would be a major crime. For that matter, very few persons living have ever seen a tuatera. It stays in seclusion most of the time. There is a single specimen in the zoological park at Wellington. When a party from a bird Antarctic expedition visited there, they were told that the lizard had not been seen for several months and that it was highly improbable that it could be lured out of hiding. One day, it would appear of its own volition, take a philosophical look at the 20th century, eat a few flies, and retire to its lair under some rocks again. Here, probably, is the secret of its race's longevity. The little lizard has spent most of its time sleeping. It has existed with minimal of effort. 
it has been satisfied with its lot and, above all, it never has gotten in the way. It has been observed, for example, that one of the creatures never climbs over even the smallest obstacle. It always will walk around. End of section 162「a single overwintering housefly theoretically might have 5,598,729,000,000 descendants in a single year. It has been calculated that a single cabbage aphis, which weighs less than a thirteenth of an ounce, might give rise in a year to a mass of descendants weighing 822 million tons, about five times as much as all the people in the world. Fortunately, nearly all insects have an enormous mortality rate. End of section 163. Section 164 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Lizard That Runs Out of Its Own Skin. There is an animal that can get out of its own skin. It is a little brown lizard, a gecko, which lives in native houses on the Palau Islands in the South Pacific. This creature, about six inches long, is closely related to the house geckos, which are found throughout the tropical Pacific Islands and as far north as Florida in the New World. The Palau species is almost impossible to capture by hand. Grabbed by the tail, it immediately sheds that organ. This is a rather common practice among certain lizards, and apparently brings little inconvenience. A new tail can be grown. But as soon as a hand is laid on this particular species, it immediately and literally runs out of its skin. This is done with lightning-like rapidity. The would-be captor is left holding the animal's empty skin. All the rest of the lizard is running away, presumably seeking a hiding place. This running out of the skin is a far different phenomenon than that of shedding the skin by various reptiles, which always takes place after a new skin has been formed underneath. The gecko just abandons its skin altogether. It flays itself alive. Escape in this way apparently is suicidal in most cases. That it ever could grow back a complete skin is highly improbable. End of section 164 Section 165 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Hi living in the Himalayas. The highest land-dwelling animals on earth are small, black, atted spiders. They live in islands of broken rock on Mount Everest at an altitude of 22,000 feet. This is far above the line of perpetual snow and nearly a mile above the last vegetation. Since there is no other living thing near them, they have to eat one another for sustenance. Presumably, their ranks always are being repleted by new arrivals from below. Highest of all living things are red-legged, black-feathered chuffs, birds of the crow family. A lone chuff has been seen in the Himalayas at 27,000 feet. There is an intimate association between these birds and mountain sheep. The chuff sits on the sheep's back and searches its hair for insects. The sheep seems to like this attention and stands still while the exploration is in progress. 
Another bird animal association at high mountain altitudes is that between mouse hares, rabbit like animals about the size of large rats, and finches. The hares live in burrows and usually are seen feeding at the entrances or running from hole to hole. Both hares and birds are seed eaters. Wild sheep and mountain goats in the Himalayas struggle up to about 17,000 feet. There are small, wingless grasshoppers at 18,000 feet. A few bees, moths, and butterflies are found at 21,000 feet. End of section 165「They live in semi-nomadic troops, each of which occupies a fairly restricted area of a forest, sometimes overlapping slightly with areas of other groups. Within their territory, members of a troop wander freely, but their activities tend to centre around food and lodge trees. In reporting on his observations of their activities, Dr. C. R. Carpenter of Columbia stated, Almost every night the group slept within earshot of camp. For eight successive nights they returned to the same group of trees. Throughout the day the troop travelled, in general, over the same routes from one food tree to another and from favourite places in the deep forest where the midday siesta occurred. Several other groups were regularly located in their own particular home areas. The monkeys resent intrusion of their territories by anything that looks like another monkey, such as a man. When approached they start barking. The usual terrier-like bark of great excitement may change to a metallic chatter repeated with great frequency. When males and sometimes adult females are approached closely, they growl in a strikingly vicious manner. Typically, they come to the terminal ends of branches, often within 40 to 50 feet of the observer, and vigorously shake these branches. Both hands and feet may be used while the animal hangs by its tail. Throwing of branches is a conspicuous part of a reactions to men. Quite frequently, they break off and drop limbs close to the intruder. Green branches sometimes, but most often large dead limbs, weighing up to 10 pounds, may be dropped. This behavior, according to Dr. Carpenter, cannot be described as throwing, although the animal may cause the object to fall away from a perpendicular by a sharp twist of its body or a swinging circular movement of its powerful tail. This dropping of objects from trees may be considered as a defensive adaptation arising from the more generalized habit of shaking branches. A significant variation occurs when the animal breaks off a limb and holds it for a time, from a second to half a minute, before letting it fall. Normally, the monkeys travel along the upper surfaces of limbs, using all four feet and carrying the tail arched over the back. When crossing from one tree to another, they use their powerful tails to support themselves from limbs. During such movements, hands, arms, and tails are used at the same time to make contacts with supports. The monkeys have a strong tendency to keep their heads upward. Therefore, when coming down a perpendicular limb, vine, or tree trunk, they go backwards rather than head foremost. They frequently make long jumps outward and downward, covering at times more than 30 feet. End of section 166. Section 167 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sherry Lynn Warren. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The insect that is born pregnant. Among nature's weirdest tricks is the strange phenomenon known as myrokinosis, reported for a single family of almost microscopic insects. The little creatures are fathers and mothers before they are born. They are a species of mite which infests grass. 
They belong to a family which, almost alone among insects, gives birth to living young. Nearly all insects are egg layers. The eggs, usually deposited in enormous numbers, hatch outside the body of the mother. Then the individuals go through a series of metamorphoses, nymph, larva, and the like, before reaching their own reproductive maturity. These grass mites, however, are born fully adult animals. A sac on the body of the female swells until it is about 500 times the original body size. It is filled with eggs and a nutritive fluid. Within this sac, the eggs hatch and the new generation passes through all the ordinary stages of insect metamorphosis. Finally, when they are fully mature, the mother dies, the sac breaks, and the host of new mites emerges. It was long thought that the mites were striking examples of parthenogenesis, or asexual reproduction. Females isolated as soon as they were born gave birth to large numbers of young. Parthenogenesis is not uncommon among the lower animals. Invariably, however, except in this one case, all the offspring are of one sex. The supposedly virgin birth families of the mites contain both males and females in various proportions. End of section 167. Section 168 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lee Vogler. Bulldog Animals. A repressed tendency towards the bulldog face apparently is deep-seated among mammals. Foxes, cattle, and pigs with bulldog appearance have been reported. In three species of dogs, the bulldog pug and the pug-nosed dog of ancient Peru, this characteristic is dominant. It could have been caused by a pronounced shortening of the rostral portion of the skull due to the failure of facial bones to develop. End of section 168 Section 169 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Foresight of Kangaroo Rats. A recent report by Dr. William T. Shaw tells of observations of giant California kangaroo rats whose food consists largely of the seeds of pepper grass. The seeds are gathered busily all day and stored in shallow surface caches, where they are dried by the dust and heat of the sun. During the night, the animals work busily, removing the dried seed to much larger chambers, deep underground, where it is to be stored for the winter. In some way, the highly intelligent animal has learned the secret of preventing mildew. Only a few other animals have mastered the same technique. The beaver and coney dry their twigs in the sun before storing them. End of section 169. Read by Sandra. Section 170 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Primitive Proturans The Proturans, blind, wingless, minute bugs found under bark and in leaf litter, are Earth's most primitive insects. They are seldom seen, and when they are noticed, are likely to be mistaken for larvae or some other insect, so obscure of the creatures that they were not discovered until early in the present century. They are about a twentieth of an inch long, yellowish, and covered with a protective shell of chitin. Sluggish and slow-moving proturans have three pairs of legs, only two of which are used for locomotion. The front pair is held up in front of the insects as it moves. These legs apparently serve the purpose of the antenna found in all higher insect orders. They are provided with primitive sense organs of touch. These little creatures presumably represent one of the earliest stages in insect evolution. 
End of section 170. Section 171 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry air-conditioned homes of beavers air ventilation of homes appears to be an engineering accomplishment of beavers the beaver hut seen from the outside according to sigvald salveson of amly novide appears to be so tight that it seems astonishing that the occupants can get sufficient air in winter when the lodge is covered with snow and ice one would not think it possible that the animals could live in apparently airtight dwellings near my home is a small lake where a beaver built a dam and a great lodge in the outlet of the lake the water was still open and i noticed the footprint of beaver on the thin ice just beyond twigs and small trunks were dragged to the open water where the animals sat on the edge of the ice and took their meals a fox had his usual track over the lodge more and more snow fell and the hut was more and more hidden under the white blanket sometimes i noticed that the fox had gone to the top of the dome and evidently sat there for a while near where he had sat was a hole in the snow about half a foot in diameter and with thin ice around the edge i found that the hole widened downward and ended on the roof of the lodge at the bottom the hole was at least two feet in diameter and its walls were hard as ice from this hole or chimney rose warm steam and the twigs and mud on the roof felt warm and damp to my hand end of section one hundred and seventy one section one seventy two of the strangest things in the world this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Demon of Puerto Rico In the deep sunless ravines of Puerto Rico's Pandora Mountains dwells the Demon Frog. It is a ghostly voice from mountainsides strewn with great decomposing granite boulders and so thickly covered with tropical vines and bushes that it is almost impenetrable to man. Until 20 years ago, it was only a voice for none of the strange little creatures ever had been seen. The mere sight of the animal, according to many of the natives, would be fatal. One might as well try to bribe a mountaineer to catch a ghost as a guajone. There is a strange quality in the voice which probably is largely responsible for the superstitious dread of the mountain people, according to the Smithsonian Institution biologist Garrett S. Miller, Jr. It is strange enough when heard from the surface, Miller reports, but it becomes even more strange after one has climbed down into the irregular and dangerous openings, which prove to be much larger and more cavernous than the surface appearance, with its dense and deceptive covering of vegetation, could lead one to expect. With flashlights, the frogs are easily found and caught as they crawl slowly over the damp but not slippery surface of the granite. To the natives, they are objects of dread. One man said they were about a foot long and armed with frightful teeth. Another assured me that anybody who saw one would die shortly afterwards. No offer of money could induce the boys or men to go into the cavities in search of them. The little creature is fantastic in appearance, chiefly due to its large protruding eyes. The edge of the eyelid is white, making a thin white line around the eye. The iris is black and gold. The skin is light brown above the nearly white underneath, but some specimens have blotches of yellow which add to the weird appearance. 
Living as they do in the semi-darkness of the mountain gullies, little is known of the life history and habits of these strange creatures. The most notable characteristic of several specimens kept alive for observation was the peculiar singing in a liquid note repeated six or seven times. It can be best imitated by whistling. This singing is believed to be part of the courtship behavior of males. The demon frog has been given the scientific name of Eleutherodactylus cocti. It appears to have been especially adapted for life among the boulders of its restricted habit. End section 172 read by Kyle Nash, San Francisco, February 22, 2022. Section 173 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Man-Made Plants At least a half dozen species of plants are man-made. They are hybrids which can transmit their basic and unique characters to future generations. The fact that what long was considered an impossibility in the plant kingdom has been achieved is revealed by Dr. H. Bentley Glass, professor of biology at Johns Hopkins University. With newly developed techniques which made possible the doubling of chromosomes, bunches of genes which are the units of heredity, the creation of species may be just at its threshold and man may take over control of evolution. The definition of species, after all, is the ability to produce offspring with the major characteristics of the parents. The first successful attempt, Dr. Glass says, was by a Russian geneticist about 30 years ago. He crossed a radish and a cabbage and produced a rabbage. When two rabbages were mated, they produced seed which sprouted into other rabbages. Unfortunately for the man who had been the first to cross one of the great barriers in biology, the rabbage was a pretty poor specimen. It had the prickly, unedible leaves of the radish and the poor root system of the cabbage. The Russian agricultural authorities had been led to expect great things. They were bitterly disappointed that the new vegetable did not fit into one of the five-year plans. The geneticist was not heard of again, and it is generally believed that he was eliminated as a reward for one of science's greatest achievements. Creators of new species have fared somewhat better in other countries, especially the United States, but they have not fared too well anywhere. In practically every case, the new species they have created have taken over the worst characters of the parent species. They have been of no commercial value. It is likely that about the same thing has happened in nature throughout the millenniums. But bad may be good. It all depends on the environment into which the new species is born. Under the right circumstance, the ravage might have superseded both radish and cabbage. That is, it might have been adapted to a change in the environment in which both parent species would have become extinct. Although no new animal species has yet been man-made, there seems no overwhelming reason why this should not happen with some of the new chromosome-doubling drugs. However, a new kind of man is not likely. Among higher animals, the mechanism of heredity is very complex indeed. It isn't likely to happen in nature in the face of atomic radiation. It has been calculated that normally there is one human mutation per generation for each 50,000 individuals. The high probability is that this mutation involves a recessive or hidden gene. Its effects do not appear in the population until two persons carrying the same recessive are mated. About 999 out of 1,000 recessive genes are bad and in due course will cause the extinction of the line in which they appear. In the long history of the race, it is likely that everybody has fallen heir to one lethal gene, but it may be a long time making its appearance in family lines. Most of the genes in any given population, good or bad, are so hidden that it is practically impossible to predict what the offspring of any particular couple will be. The recessive genes have vastly increased through the operation of human melting pots all over the world in the last few generations. One result is the minority races tend to become absorbed in majorities. Thus, the relatively small American Negro population, without any further intermarriage but purely through the cropping out of recessive already received from the white majority, will be entirely amalgamated in the more numerous race in approximately 2,000 years. Genetics is getting into the hands of scientists' tools which can speed up the natural process of change about 1,000-fold, and this may result in either good or evil. The good side is well illustrated by hybrid corn. 
a plant which cannot be considered a new species. This lately has been carried to the point where corn, with much more sugar in its stalks and only six instead of 12 feet high, can be produced. End section 173. Read by Kyle Nash, San Francisco, February 22, 2022. Section 174 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Seal Migration. The great annual northward migration of the seals is one of the most remarkable phenomena of animal life. It seems to be without organization and without leadership. Yet toward the end of March each year, the hundreds of thousands of cow seals and pups scattered over thousands of square miles of water start at about the same time in three great groups bound for three specific places. It has been the same for centuries, perhaps millenniums. Each animal moves at about the same rate so that all arrive within a few days of each other. Unlike birds, they do not move in compact masses. Three great herds exist. The American herd of about 1,500,000, is by far the largest of the three. It goes straight to the Pribilofs, where it goes ashore on two almost barren islands, St. Paul and St. George. The Japanese herd, numbering about 40,000, makes for Robin Island, off northern Japan. The Russian herd, now estimated at about 200,000, goes to a few rocky islands of the Commander Archipelago, off Kamchatka. The moving herds consist almost entirely of females and young. The bulls winter further north, tend to be solitary during the winter, and precede the cows to the summer homes. The breeding season lasts for about two months. During this time, the bull never eats or touches a drop of water. He never leaves the land. He arrives sleek and fat from the ocean pasture and is able to survive entirely on stored energy. This keeps him alive, even when he fights scores of terrible battles with younger rivals. Toward the end of the summer, he naturally is a sorry-looking creature. One day, actuated by some common impulse, cows and calves depart. Then the bulls, their arduous labors of race propagation over for ten months, draw back among the rocks for a long rest. End of section 174. Read by Kyle Nash, San Francisco, February 22, 2022. Section 175 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic Bark of the Chinchona Tree. The shadow of a pale Spanish lady, dead for almost three centuries, has returned to the dense rainforests of western slopes of the Andes. The shadow is that of the Countess of Chinchon wife of the redoubtable Don Luis Geronimo de Cabrera Bondalia y Mendoza, colonial viceroy of Peru. She was dying of a strange disease in Lima in 1638. Her Jesuit confessor, the story goes, gave a medicine to her doctor made from the bark of a common Peruvian tree. It supposedly saved her life, and two years later, she returned to Spain, carrying with her some of the magic bark. Thus, she gave to the world one of the supreme medicines of all time. A century later, the Swedish botanist Linnaeus tried to pay a compliment to the long-dead beauty, but misspelled her name, calling her tree Chinchona. Out of it came quinine. The Andean forest remained for 200 years the only source of the magic drug quinine. The Chinchona trees grew wild. They were stripped of bark recklessly and became very scarce. By 1850, the price of quinine was $50 an ounce, and only the rich could afford to have malaria. The British tried to transplant the tree in India and failed. Then Dutch botanists obtained some seed, planted in the East Indies, and developed high-yielding species. Soon, this region became the sole source of the world's supply. The price dropped to 18 cents an ounce, and the lands over which the long-dead countess had ruled dropped out of the picture. Now, South American countries, notably Venezuela and Bolivia, are reclaiming the crop with improved varieties of the chinchona tree, equal to the best produced by the Dutch. They are regaining rapidly the dead lady's gift. 
End section 175. Read by Kyle Nash, San Francisco, February 22nd, 2022. Section 176 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Columbia's Ant Tree. In the sparsely inhabited tropical portion of eastern Colombia is an ant tree known as the Barasanta. It is a small, slender tree with showy red flowers, which grows 25 to 30 feet in height. Both trunk and branches are hollow and filled with masses of vicious biting ants. As soon as the tree is disturbed, the insects swarm upon the invader. As a result, the tree is generally left alone both by Indians and white settlers. The ants are protected by the branches and in turn protect the host with their fighting prowess. A curious shrub which grows out of enormous ant hills found through the Llanos region of western Colombia furnishes quite a different example of insect plant association. The ants are leaf cutters. All other plant life avoids their immediate neighborhood. This particular shrub exudes a vicious, milky juice which traps any ant which try to climb toward its leaves. Hence, the insects have learned to leave it alone, and it enjoys the rich ant hill soil without competition from other plants. End of section 176. Read by Kyle Nash, San Francisco, February 22nd, 2022. Section number 177 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brianna Childs. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Strange Behavior of Plants. The behavior characteristics of some American plants are strange indeed. The compass plant, a bristly perennial of the aster family, which grows in abundance over the prairies, is a living compass. It turns the edges of its leaves in a general north-south direction. Another American plant, the wild lettuce, does the same thing. The result is that when the intensity of sunlight is weakest in the morning, and evening, the flat surfaces of the leaves are in a position to receive the maximum available amount of light. At noon, when there is more light than the plant needs, only the edges of the leaves are turned towards the sun. Then there is the English ivy, which arranges its leaves in a mosaic pattern, so that about the greatest possible area is exposed to the light. Other plants show equally precise adaptations to their light requirements. It is all associated with the process of photosynthesis, i.e., the manufacture by the plant of carbohydrates out of carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light. The strength of light needed for this process varies somewhat with the particular plant and its conditions. The phenomenon is one of the most vital in creation the transformation of the sun's energy into the fuel of animal life. Without it, life would be impossible. Some plants work under high light intensities, such as those which must adapt themselves on the desert areas of the southwestern United States. Others thrive best in the subdued light of a dense forest. One curious little moss grows in caves where there is almost no light at all. It is equipped with a plate of cells forming a battery of lenses capable of focusing the scattered light on the bodies especially concerned in carbohydrate formation. These are the chloroplasts, which contain the mysterious substance, chlorophyll, which acts as a catalyst for action of sunlight on carbon dioxide and water. The shape and arrangement of cells containing the chloroplasts are such that the amount of chlorophyll exposed to the sunlight can be varied. A specially devised apparatus has been constructed in the Smithsonian Laboratory for quantitative studies of the way plants absorb carbon dioxide under different lighting conditions. 
Not only is the process greatly affected by the intensity of the light, the experiments show, but the wavelength also is of paramount importance. The experimental plants are grown with their roots in a nutrient solution and their tops extending into a double-walled glass tube. They are furnished light from the surrounding lamps so that the intensity and wavelengths of the light can be varied as desired. Through the tube, air containing different amounts of carbon dioxide can be passed. Thus, every element of the process is under rigid control of the experimenters. The experiment already has shown that the correct combination of wavelengths is of the utmost importance in making up synthetic light. Thus, regardless of the intensity, the ordinary electric light, when used alone, has been demonstrated to be a poor light source. Its maximum energy occurs in the infrared region, below the limit of visibility, while that of sunlight falls in the green-blue region. If tomato plants are grown under high-powered Mazda lamps in the Smithsonian's special growth chambers, especially when the humidity is high, their leaves turn pale and almost white. Chlorophyll disappears under these conditions. End of section 177. Section number 178 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brianna Childs. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Venezuela's Nocturnal Orchid. A flower that opens only by moonlight is one of Venezuela's plant curiosities. It is an ivory-white, velvety orchid, which depends entirely on nocturnal butterflies to sip its nectar while pollinization takes place. The plant is one of 800 species of Venezuelan orchids. Among these is probably the prettiest and rarest of the orchid family, the mother-of-pearl flower which can sometimes be found in the deep jungles of the Gran Sabana area at altitudes of more than 3,000 feet. Still another high mountain variety has square petals with fringed edges. Another, found in the jungles of the upper Orinoco, has blossoms measuring up to 16 inches in diameter. A unique Venezuelan orchid grows only in water. Throughout the world, there are more than 20,000 species of orchids, the great majority of which are found only in mountainous regions of the tropics. A few, however, grow as far north as the Arctic Circle. End of section number 178. Section number 179 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brianna Childs. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Plant That Strikes Men Dumb. A plant cultivated in the gardens of the Venezuelan National University at Caracas might well be a boon to the pestered husbands and harassed mothers. It is described under the popular Spanish name of Planta del Mudo. It looks like sugar cane. According to the probably exaggerated claims, anybody who chews the stem is stricken dumb for at least 48 hours, presumably due to some paralyzing effect on some part of the vocal apparatus. It is not known whether anybody has tried to extract the marvelous talk-stopping principle. American botanists are unable to identify the plant. They explain, however, the northern portion of South America long has been known as the world's greatest storehouse of plants with strange physiological effects. There is one, for example, alleged to grow hair on bald heads, Another which makes everything look red. End of section number 179. 
Section number 180 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brianna Childs. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. Combat of Moth and Shrew. A strange fight between a gray shrew, smallest of North American mammals, and a black witch moth has been described by Lawrence M. Huey of the San Diego Society of Natural History. The moth, with a wing spread of about four inches and a body size almost equal to that of the shrew, was placed in a cage with the mammal. The shrew proved too much for the insect after the odds had been equalized by clipping a great part of the latter's wings. Even with this severe handicap, reports Mr. Huey, the moth was still very strong, and, as its body was so large, the shrew attacked it by grasping one of its wing stubs, tugging with main strength and hanging on like a bulldog. Once, in a burst of spirited action, the shrew was pitched halfway across the cage. This only caused a more determined attack, and the moth finally was killed and eaten. Another moth, with a body about three-quarters of an inch long, was placed in the cage. It had lost many of the scales from its wings, and was partially disabled. It could fly feebly, however, from one side of the cage to the other. The shrew, apparently, by its sense of hearing, kept following the course of the moth until its flight carried it about two inches above the little mammal. Then, with an almost invisible quickness, the animal sprang and seized the moth in the air, much as a basketball player leaps to catch a ball high over his head. A few crunches with the sharp-toothed jaws dispatched the moth. End of section number 180. Section 181 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lee Vogler. The Ferocious Snake Weasel From South Africa comes a report from Dr. Raymond B. Cowles of a fight between a deadly reptile and a little-known mammal, the Indian Galizzi, or Snake Weasel. The habitat of the snake weasel, unknown in any zoo, is the Umzumbi Valley in Natal Province, where it is one of the rarest of carnivores. Natives either refuse to bring in any Ingalizis or demand exorbitant prices for their skins. All parts of the body are used in the native pharmacopoeia, and elders wear a narrow strip of the fur to ward off evil and bring good luck. Little is known concerning the habits of the animal, except that it apparently frequents burrows of subterranean animals and gardens, sometimes is plowed up, and will attack and kill large snakes. A reliable Zulu described to Dr. Cowles a fight between one of them and a deadly mamba about seven feet long. He said he had been watching the snake basking in the sun in a coiled position, after a few moments, a movement in the bushes caught his attention, and he saw an Indian Galizzi cautiously stealing toward the snake. When within a foot or two, the animal suddenly leaped upon the reptile and fastened its teeth just behind the head, where it clung during the ensuing wild struggle. After a few minutes, it succeeded in killing the snake, whereupon it relinquished its hold performed its toilet, and left without eating any of its prey. End of section 181 Section 182 of The Strangest Things in the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Rabbit That Swims Life history and habits of a swimming rabbit are the subject of a report to the American Society of Mammalogists. The animal is the little-known marsh rabbit of the South Carolina coast. It spends most of its life on the tidal marshes and hence alone of the rabbit family has become a partially aquarian animal. Almost strictly nocturnal in its habits, its ways of life hitherto have eluded naturalists. By far the best-known trait of the species is its liking for water. Individuals sometimes are encountered in daytime far out in one of the coastal rivers. In summer, when the water is warm, they take to it readily. They seldom are observed, however, swimming in cold water. In fall and winter, the little animal leads the precarious existence. It is the favorite food of the great marsh hawks, continuously circling over the swamps. When spring comes, the birds leave for the north. The sedges grow tall so as to conceal completely the timid little animals and they are left in peace until the frosts of autumn. Generally, the marsh rabbit is a home-loving creature, but floods in the freshwater area of its habitat sometimes force a migration. It is a natural swimmer. On land, it walks with a swimming motion. Other rabbits are practically helpless in the water and try to swim with the hopping motions they use on land. The rare special type appears to be holding its own in spite of its many enemies. End of section 182「ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、ここで、The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry Gorilla Warriors of the Belgian Congo A study of mountain gorillas in a part of the world which they have all to themselves has been reported by Captain C. S. R. Pittman British zoologist. The only humans who ever penetrate the dense forests of the Uganda border of the Belgian Congo, where these animals are found, are pygmies, with whom the great apes live in the best of terms. Captain Pittman is one of the few white men ever to have entered the area. The mountain gorilla is probably the highest of all the gorillas, next to men. One of the two or three ever in captivity was an infant cap at the National Zoological Park in Washington, D.C. Its brain was the largest ever found in an infrahuman creature. It almost matched the smallest normal human brains. Captain Pittman found the gorilla quite a likable and peaceful animal. He says, Around the male gorilla, on account of its enormous size and strength, Coupled in recent years with frequent lapses from grace provoked by unnecessary and undue interference, there has been woven and unfortunately published a fantasy of inaccuracy and exaggeration, so much so that the very homely old male is visualized as an object of dread. The male gorilla as the family head is most solicitous for the welfare of his wives and children, a very human trait. On the threat of danger, he accepts full responsibility for the well-being of his charts. If the danger is real, the females and young are sent off, while the father waits to take on all corners until satisfied that the remainder of the band are out of harm's way. Sometimes, when their danger is sudden and overwhelming, the youngsters are sent up trees to hide until the trouble was over. It is strangely reminiscent of the records of some of the early African explorers relative to tribal customs. 
When the woman folk were to be seen busily engaged in their usual vocations in the precincts of a village, all was well and no hostility contemplated on the part of the local inhabitants. But an absence of women and children was interpreted as unfavorable, signifying that they had been removed to a safe place to enable the warriors to fight unhampered. And so it is with the old male gorilla, for as soon as he bids his family seek safety, he is out for mischief, although without direct provocation he is unlikely to attack. There are black sheep in every fold and solitary examples, both male and female, which probably have been outlaws for a very good reason, have been known to be abnormally aggressive. End of section 183「Section No.184 of The Strangest Things in the World」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brianna Childs The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry The Biggest Rat in the World Close relative of the porcupine, but without quills, is the aquatic koipu, or nutria of South America. It has become quite valuable in recent years because of its soft fur. Weighing about 20 pounds, it often is referred to as the biggest rat in the world. It shares with the porcupine large, orange-colored incisor teeth, which give it a frightful appearance. Like its barbed northern cousin, it is a strict vegetarian, living exclusively on water weeds in its native habitat. Before the last war, Koipu farms were being established through much of Europe. However, some apprehension was felt that it might cause considerable damage to crops if it escaped from its enclosures. End of section number 184. Section 185 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by B.K.L. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Suicide Marches of Lemmings. Mass death marches of lemmings long have intrigued biologists and psychologists. The Lapland lemming is a short-tailed animal related to the meadow mouse that looks like a miniature rabbit. Through the sub-arctic winter, it lives completely buried under snow, through which it burrows in search of mosses and lichens. It is extremely prolific. Females produce two litters of from four to six offspring every year. The numbers soon become far too great to subsist on the sparse supply available in the Scandinavian mountains. Then, irregularly in periods of from five to ten years, occurs one of the weirdest phenomena of animal life, acting apparently on a common subconscious simultaneous impulse. The entire lemming population starts a mass migration out of the mountains to the lowlands. The animals proceed in a straight line, a few feet apart, each usually tracing a shallow furrow in the soil. They are a devouring scourge, stripping the earth of all vegetation in their path. Their progress seems irresistible. No obstacle stops them. If they come across a man, they glide between his legs. If they meet with a haystack, they gnaw through it. If a rock stands in their way, they go around it in a semicircle and then resume the straight line of their march. When they come to a lake, river, or arm of the sea, they swim directly across, vast numbers being drowned on the way. If they encounter a boat, they climb over it so as not to be diverted from a straight line. Curiously, they seem to avoid human habitations. They resist fiercely all efforts to stop them. They will bite a stick or hand, crying and barking like little dogs. Multitudes are destroyed every mile of the way. When the migrating horde reaches the sea, it moves straight on to inevitable destruction.
a few linger behind and eventually make their way back to the mountain habitat. Numbers are so reduced that they are seldom observed. Then a new generation starts and builds up for the next migration. End of section 185. Section 186 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Ferocity of the Tiger. Symbol of ferocity in the animal world is the tiger. When troops of the American 101st Division entered the German city of Halle in 1945, it probably was considered effective psychological warfare tactics on the part of the Nazis to open the zoo cages and let loose the tigers. So far as known, however, the animals did not attack any Americans. Whether the reputation of the tiger is entirely justified is debatable. The tiger, says Dr. William M. Mann, longtime director of the National Zoological Park in Washington, is one of the finest animals that lives. In the cage, he is the most snobbish of all aristocrats. His contempt for those who jostle in front of his bars being nothing less than magnificent. He is dignity itself. He condescends to no boyish antics to attract attention, as does the chimpanzee, to no begging for sweets, as do the bear and elephant, to no pacific philosophic acceptance of fate, such as that of the hippopotamus. You cannot win his favor by a stick of candy. He is above rage or gratitude. Sometimes adult tigers are captured in traps and sold to circuses. One American circus some years ago had a cage of ten. Their keeper made them perform as another man might spaniels. In the arena they appeared to be a ferocious group. In the menagerie tent, confined in small cages like so many kittens, the keeper could put his hand in their mouths and rub their teeth. Once he complained bitterly about the tranquility of his charges. I cannot make a show with ten tame tigers, he argued. I must have five mean ones to add to the act. The tiger had a prominent part in the menageries of Indian and Chinese monarchs before the Christian era. It first appeared in Europe about the time of the eastern conquest of Alexander. Well known to the Romans, the animal was one of the most dreaded of all the beasts that appeared in the arena. Despite its supposed ferocity, no great harm has been done in the few cases in which tigers have escaped from zoos. Often, they have returned of their own accord. End of section 186 Section 187 of The Strangest Things in the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Fearsome Porcupine. There are more than 1,000 minute barbs on each of a porcupine's many quills. This is the reason why such a quill is very difficult to withdraw from the flesh. The armament of quills, from a half inch to three inches long, and developed from hairs of the underfur, renders the spiny pig of northern woodlands almost immune to attack. About its only enemy in nature is the giant weasel, the fisher, which has learned the trick of quickly turning the porcupine on its back. The quills are very lightly attached to the porcupine's body and become detached almost automatically when the creature is attacked. That they can be shot, however, is almost certainly a fallacy. A victim must actually be in contact with the animal. 
End of section 187. Section 189 of The Strangest Things in the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Strangest Things in the World by Thomas Henry. The Puzzling Platypus. Fantastic combination of mammal, bird, and reptile is the egg-laying, toothless water animal of New South Wales and Tasmania, Australia, the duck-billed platypus. It is clearly a mammal, but, with a single exception, it stands quite alone among these warm-blooded animals. The creatures from which it is a survivor probably have been extinct for 50 million years. It is an animal about 20 inches long from the tip of its horny beak to the end of its broad, flattened tail. It is covered with soft brown fur, its four legs are short and five-toed. These toes on the front foot are joined by webs like those of aquatic birds, which extend beyond the long, sharp, curved toenails. On the hind legs of the male are inch-long, sharp spurs, through which run minute canals, connected with a large gland at the back of the thigh, very much like the poison fangs of a serpent. Yet, so far as can be determined, the gland secretes no poison, and the spurs apparently are seldom used in self-defense. The female lays two eggs at a time, each about three-fourths of an inch long and a half inch wide, with strong, flexible white shells. These eggs are not incubated, but hatch buried shallowly in sand and straw. The platypus lives on the banks of ponds and quiet streams, where it digs burrows as much as twenty feet long, with two entrances, one below and the other above water level. The rear, or land, end of the burrow is enlarged into a small chamber in which the young are reared. The creatures pass most of the daylight hours asleep in these burrows, curled in rather tight balls. The entrances are concealed in grass and reeds, so that the occupants of the burrows are seldom seen. At night, the platypus takes to the water. It swims and dives easily, and its major food consists of worms and other aquatic animals found in the mud or gravel at the bottom. It has cheek pouches like a squirrel. When it comes up from a dive, these pouches are stuffed with the food it has gathered, which is extracted and eaten at leisure. Adult animals are toothless, but in each jaw there is a horny ridge. The young, however, have rootless teeth, a possible clue to their very remote ancestry. Like a bird, the platypus has a very small head. There is no division of its brain into two hemispheres, as in all other mammals and most birds. This is a characteristic of the reptile brain. The creatures can climb with apparent ease. Small groups sometimes are seen sunning themselves on broad tree trunks overhanging the water, they are extremely timid, but when captured soon become quite tame. In captivity, however, they seldom live long. The only other member of this animal group is the echidna, or spiny anteater, of the same part of the world. It is, however, an inhabitant of rocky districts where it digs shallow burrows in sand and hides in rock crevices. The back is covered with sharp, backward-directed spines which give it the appearance of a small porcupine. It has a long, tubular snout from which projects the long, slender tongue covered with some sticky substance. With this, it laps up ants and other insects. Like the platypus, it has short, strong legs with large claws, with which it burrows with considerable speed. Burrowing, where possible, is the usual method of flight. Its other defense is to roll itself into a ball, when its sharp spines give it considerable protection. The only way of carrying the creature, says George Bennett, gatherings of a naturalist in Australasia, is by one of its hind legs. Its powerful resistance and the sharpness of the spines will soon oblige the captor, attempting to seize it by any other part of the body, to relinquish his hold. End of section 189. End of The Strangest Things in the World, a book about extraordinary manifestations of nature, by Thomas Henry.